The sitting is uh, open. Please take your seats here in the hemicycle. May I remember, members, that it is a requirement for everyone here to wear a mask, but this may be removed when taking the floor. I remind members taking part remotely that they should take part in proceedings from a quiet location and should not speak from cars, trains or other modes of transport in order to ensure good communication. We now move to the debate under urgent procedure on consequences of the Russian aggression for, uh, against Ukraine uh, as you find in document 15477. It will be presented by Madam Inga Skou on behalf of the Committee of Political Affairs and Democracy. The debate will continue this afternoon with the sitting starting at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. I will interrupt this, tomorrow, uh, this morning the list of speakers at about 1 p.m. Hey, colleagues, we will have a record number of speakers. There are 167 members on the speak speakers list, plus five speakers on behalf of the political groups. I would like to ask for your solidarity and your discipline so that we can allow as many people as possible. That means that three minutes will be three minutes in the, in the debate for everyone as a matter of solidarity. Now, I first call uh, Madam Skou. Uh, I already thank you for the great work that you are doing, Ingert. Uh, uh, our compliments. Uh, it will be a long day for you as well. You now have seven minutes to present the report, and then we'll have a further three minutes to reply to the end uh, of the debate. And if you then need some minutes more, of course, they will be available for you. You have the floor, Ingert. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, fellow parliamentarians. Firstly, allow me to address our Ukrainian colleagues. I speak for everyone here today when I say that our hearts bleed and you, for you and uh, your people. You are the victims of this war of aggression of which the leadership of the Russian Federation bears the full responsibility. They should and will be held to account. President, today we will discuss the consequences of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Our list of speakers bear witness of this being a historic and extraordinary situation, calling for extraordinary measures. Never before have so many wanted to participate in a, in a debate. Never before have one of our member states launched a full-fledged invasion of another. Never before have we had to debate asking the committee of ministers to exclude a member state. Since 2009, when I joined PACE, we have faced challenges. We have debated, we have agreed and disagreed, and as an assembly, we have overcome crisis. We have come out stronger. Working with the Committee of Ministers and the Secretary General, we have become a more united Council of Europe. It is therefore the wasting, discussing, depriving more than 140 million Europeans their access to our organization, our Court of Human Rights. This Russian aggression has been ongoing since 2014. Since the 24th February, however, it has become all-out war, a war resulting in thousands of civilian casualties, included hundreds of deaths. It has displaced millions of people inside and outside Ukraine. It has caused utter devastation. We must stand by the Ukrainian people, upholding their rights to live in an independent and sovereign state the territorial integrity of which is respected. We must do everything to our, to our power for immediate cessation of the hostilities and contribute to tackling the humanitarian crisis. It is necessary to scale up the response to meet humanitarian needs. The establishment of safe humanitarian corridors out of Ukraine and access to humanitarian agencies is needed. 
The efforts by Council of Europe member states neighboring Ukraine should be commended. And irrespective of their geographical proxim proximity with, with Ukraine, all member states should play a role in welcoming Ukrainians and providing assistance. The Council of Europe should be on the front line in helping Ukraine. A number of initiatives are described in the, re in the report. Please support them. President, in 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev spoke to this assembly about the, his idea of our common European home. It was a time of growing optimism and rapprochement. Three decades later, pessimism and animosity is uh, on the rise. The Council of Europe is condemning this war of aggression, which is reinstated fear in Europe. Pace is uniting today in condemning this war of aggression, which is a clear violation of the Charter of the United Nations, the Council of Europe statute, and the Russian Federation's obligations and commitments as a member of the organization. Through its action, the Russian Federation is turning its back on our common European home. On February the 25th, the Committee of Ministers decided to suspend the representation rights of the, Euro the Russian Federation in the Council of Europe. On March the 10th, it decided to ask the Assembly's opinion on the potential further use of Article 8. We must respond, Mr. President, with a clear opinion. I hope it will be unanimous. A united pace and a united Council of Europe is a stronger Council of Europe. Since 2014, I have repeatedly condemned the Russian annexation of Crimea and their ex actions in eastern Ukraine. At the same time, I have underlined the role of the Council of Europe as an arena for pan-European dialogue, as well as the importance of the access of the people of Russia to our European Court of Human Rights. This is why I have argue, argued that we must keep the Russian people in the European fold and voted in favor of recognizing the credentials of the Russian delegation. But this war, war is a point of no return. A point of no return. In the common European home, there is no place for an aggressor. And President, the draft opinion includes several recommendations but most important, it includes a proposal to request the Russian Federation to withdraw from the Council of Europe. In the political committee, we have discussed the draft opinion in detail. We have worked through numerous amendments. What I present today is a text with a strong message to the Committee of Ministers. It is a text that I hope all 46 participating delegation can support and stand behind. When we stand united, we are stronger Council, Council of Europe, irrespective of the decision which the Committee of Ministers will take in relation to further use of Article 8, the Council of Europe should continue to reach out to the Russian people, many of whom who do not support this war and do not have access to independent and objective information about it. We should imaginative and find way, ways to offer a platform to all those Russians who share the Council of Europe's value, values. And President, the leadership of the Russian Federation is clearly in violation of their statutory obligations. They have shown no desire to remain part of European based on shared values and principles, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. This we cannot accept. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam uh, Rapporteur. As this is an extraordinary session, uh, I will now give the floor before we are going to listen to the five representatives of the political groups floor to the chair of the parliamentary delegation of Ukraine, Madam Maria Mazentseva. Maria, you have the floor. Thank you, dear president. 
Dear colleagues, today I will be speaking not as a politician, but as a human being, representing the whole nation of Ukraine, not just Ukrainian parliament, which has been under attack. Finally, after eight years and 20 days of war, we send a very firm message to soon to be former member state of this highly respected organization which is focusing on human rights to the Russian Federation. That is, there is no place for such brutal state to be here among us. Dear colleagues, we have made a very long way to be present here with you, but not only us, also the children of our members of the delegation. And once we think the resolution is passed with very strong arguments, with a very ambitious debates being held in political committee. Where are we coming back? Can we say we're coming back home? For many of us, the answer is no. But we definitely come back home to our homeland, to Ukraine, where Ukrainian parliament continues to work and pass all the necessary laws for security and defense where the president remains in his office together with the members of government. And when the brave people of Ukraine at every level, whether they are serving in the army or they are healing people in the hospitals or they are trying to evacuate those who can't access food and water for weeks already. And this is good that this moment is stipulated in our resolution. We call on the member states, which you colleagues represent, to continue a sufficient support which you managed to deliver in terms of humanitarian aid. Nevertheless, we are not an organization for security and defense. I highly thank, on the name of Ukraine, for the military assistance your member state has given to us. And it is a matter of the safety of Sky which NATO member states hasn't taken a decision upon yet. We're facing not only a genocide of European nation in the continent, but also ecocide, because the 15 reactors of the power plants in Ukraine can turn our daily life on the planet of Earth into a hell. Dear colleagues, for many, these papers on our tables are only words, but please understand our presence here, the votes we will be casting is a huge support for Ukrainians. And we highly appreciate your personal trips you have conducted, not being fair of traveling to Ukraine. Your governments, your parliaments are continuing to support us on the ground. The millions of refugees, it's already more than 2.5 million people, which you are hosting, and we're highly thankful for that as well, and many more millions of IDPs who me and my colleagues have turned to, will continue to work on a daily basis for the protection of the human rights. And I call on the Russian Federation authorities who are now kidnapping mayors of Ukrainian cities civil activists, the representatives of local authorities to be stopped doing that because this is a point of no return. We have to understand that the blitzkrieg, which was supposed to happen as Putin thought in two days time, will not happen. This fight for the freedom of the whole Europe will continue until the very end. This is just a question to you, dear colleagues, which side of the history you are taking here. And I'm sure the assembly will show the right side. And please, colleagues, our, we cast our vote in the very end of this historical session with the very long lasting debate. We, as Ukrainians, they, they might not see it at the moment because now they are in the basements with no internet and phone connection. I want us to go outside and to take the Russian flag down. There is no place for this brutality at the subcontinent of Europe, in, in the Council of Europe. 
Thank you, dear President. Glory to Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Maria. Uh, now, uh, we will call in the debate uh, five speakers on behalf of the political groups. And first, in the debate, I call Frank Schwabe from Germany on behalf of the group of the Socialist Democrats and Greens. Frank, you have the floor. Dear, dear President, uh, dear Maria, uh, thank you, Rapporteur. It's not easy for sure to speak after such a speech about the really heartbreaking situation the Ukrainians um, have to face in a situation we, of human disaster we cannot really describe. Um, but we have to do what we can do here. And the Committee of Ministers was represented there, asked us for an opinion, not giving, let's say, us a kind of clear guidance. It's quite open. Uh, what you ask us, and it's up to us to give a very crystal clear answer. What is our opinion to the situation now? And the opinion in the report now already, and we will see it with a vast majority in the evening, is to expel the Russian Federation from this organization as soon as possible. It means immediately. You are those one who care for the procedures, but the request here will be this day, do it immediately. We had a lot of discussions in my group of Socialist Democrats and Greens, and there was no one, not even one voice who had another opinion. There was no one who thought we should stand, and we should stay with the suspension. Everyone said we have to go very clear to exclude Russia from this organization. It's a horrific situation the Ukrainians have to face and we have really to do everything and we can do it today with an amendment to make sure that we take those one responsible who commit war crimes in this moment. Maybe we have instruments already internationally, maybe we need additional instruments. I think we will come back to this question in April. This is not a war from Russians against Ukrainians. It is not. It is a war between democracy, where we stand for, and dictatorship, where the worldwide representative is Putin. I really saw, and I think all of you saw, the brave woman yesterday in Russia who go to the TV and risk what she can risk in this situation um, for her personal situation and her personal life. But this makes sure that there are Russians who don't believe in dictatorship, who wants to stand for democracy as well. But they have somebody who we have to call till now the representative of the country. And since he is the president of the country, we cannot allow them to be here. So let's be very clear. The message today will be to expel Russia from this organization. Let's stand with Ukraine. Let's stop Putin's war. And let's ma make very clear for what this organization stands for. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Now I call in the debate Alexander Poitsche from Poland. He speaks on behalf of the EPP group. Alexander, you have the floor. Merci. Merci, le Président. Chers collègues, le 24 février restera dans l'histoire comme un tournant majeur. Au nom du groupe PPE, je voudrais rendre hommage aux victimes innocentes et saluer le courage du peuple ukrainien qui défend son pays, sa liberté, sa identité. Devant la violence de l'armée russe qui bombarde des villes et tue des centaines de civils innocents, dont les femmes et les enfants, nous ne pouvons pas rester impassibles. Aujourd'hui, ce qui se passe à Kiev à Kharkiv, Mariupol, c'est Grozny et Alep en Europe. En tant que parlementaire membre de cette Assemblée, il est de notre responsabilité de réagir face à cette tragédie. Alors, que pouvons-nous faire D'abord, on peut 
se féliciter de l'unité des Européennes et de nous tous ici, dans cette organisation. Par le passé, beaucoup d'entre nous ont fait preuve d'une certaine naïveté à l'égard du Moscou. Beaucoup sont restés aveugles et sourdes aux avertissements des pays de l'Est face à la guerre en Géorgie, à l'invasion de la Crimée, dans les Donbass, agression contre Moldavie et occupation des Transnestrie. Aujourd'hui, les pays européens sont unis pour dénoncer les crimes de Poutine et de son complice biélorusse. Nous devons apporter notre aide et notre soutien au peuple ukrainien. Nous devons accueillir les réfugiés, livrer l'aide humanitaire, mais aussi euh, tout ce que nous pouvons faire pour l'Ukraine. Car cette guerre n'est pas un conflit localisé. C'est une véritable guerre idéologique, une guerre d'extermination contre l'Ukraine, son peuple, son identité. Une guerre de la tyrannie contre la démocratie, de la force contre le droit. La Russie de Poutine n'a plus sa place au Conseil de l'Europe. Mais il faut aider en même temps la société civile russe face à la répression des autorités et à la propagande du régime. Un jour, et je le crois sincèrement, la Russie sera un État démocratique et retrouvera sa place parmi nous, mais doit cesser cette agression. Et pour finir mon intervention, je me permets de citer en anglais la parole de chanson de Sting, Russians. And the first, I must make a confession. When I was very young, I was also very naive, because I really believed In those words, we share the same biology, regardless of ideology. Believe me when I say to you, I hope the Russians love their children too. But today, when I see in the Russian TV, people saying that they should hang Ukrainians because they are defending their country, I have the doubts if the Russian loves any children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Now I give the floor to Madam Olena Komenko from Ukraine, and she speaks on behalf of the ECDA group. Olena, you have the floor. Mr. President, dear members of the Assembly, it is high time for the Council of Europe to come out of the box and apply courageous decision to exclude Russia from the club of like-minded countries. When we say council, we mean a consultative format where decisions are taken in a dialogue and mutual respect. This is not the approach Russia takes. It prefers to act brutally, unilaterally, completely disregarding the established order of mutual coexistence. Russia laughs over slow and cautious actions of European countries. It counts on your fear fear to stand up against aggression and to counter your actions bravely. Russia exploits your faint heartedness Bloodthirsty predator generates its appetite for ever more victims and spread death around you. It is not about counseling. It is about arrogant behavior based on impunity. How dare we are talking about the impeachment when Russia show, showers civilians with internationally prohibited types of bombs threaten Europeans, European civilization with, uh, with almost extinction, while hinting on a possibility to use chemical and biological weapon, blowing up nuclear sites to cause ecological disaster with mortal consequences, using tactical nuclear bombs to punish disobedient Ukraine and exterminate new generations of Europe. Europe must act accordingly. It is not enough to say we condemn. We need to show that we are resolute to act. That Europe is not a sleepy mammal, but a brave, dignified protector of the highest value, a human life, who is ready to act and punish the aggressor. Excluding Russia from the Council of Europe is already an overdue decision. 
and it is least thing which we could do. It is not an adequate response to cold-blooded killing of hundreds of innocent children, ruined lives and wounded souls. But at least it is something that the responsible and mature democracies should do. It will not prevent Russia from further atrocities. This is not enough. We have to be prepared to further horrors. But this decision will enable you to say the word that you are fearless and intolerant fi fighter for human life and dignity. This is what the Council of Europe is designed for. Do not apply ostrich tactics to hide your hand in the sand. Be brave to face the threat and to respond. While I appreciate it is not in the mandate, uh, mandate of the Council of Europe, many of you are members of Parliament from NATO countries, and I would like you to reflect on the following. This is not just another war on your TV screen. This is not a Hollywood movie where the good guys always prevail over, over bad guys. This is real. Real people are dying. Real maternity hospitals are being attacked. Real housing units are being shelled with 500 kilograms bombs and wars. My colleagues here present and those defending my hometowns in, and real human beings, we are real, I am real. While you're, you all watch from the comfort of your safe house those horrific images, and snake your heads in disapproval. We can smell those images, taste them of, in our mouth. And while we all now enjoy the safety of Strasbourg, Strasbourg, have a glass of wine, or enjoy the beauty of the city, my hometown, Kiev, with 1,500 years of history, is being destroyed. Yes, it is the place where my colleagues and I will return tomorrow. Willingly and knowingly, because that is where we belong. That is our land that is being invaded. We understand your concerns about no-fly zone, but do you understand our concerns too? Three weeks ago, we could never have imagined to be in this situation, and 100% sure it would never happen, as you are now 100% sure that it will not happen to you. Last but not the least, in about one month, we convened for the April part session. The way things are going now and on the ground in Ukraine, it is not excluded that in April, one of us, maybe more, will no longer be with you. The place could be empty next session. I hope you will keep this in mind when we are begging you for your urgent support. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you, Olena. I allowed you to use a bit more speaking time, as everybody will understand. From now, the speaking time will be exactly to limited to three minutes to get everybody a fair chance to participate. Prochain orateur dans notre débat, Jacques Maire de la France, et il parle au nom du groupe ADL. -E. Vous avez la parole, Jacques. Merci. Merci, Président. Merci, Tini. Euh, merci à, à ces chers collègues luthériennes. Merci à Maria. Merci à Olena pour leur témoignage. Parce que nous traversons aujourd'hui une véritable tragédie. Une tragédie d'abord pour vous, Ukrainiens, qui subissez depuis 2014 une guerre, une guerre menée par la Russie, qu'ont connu les Géorgiens, les Moldaves, les Tchétchènes, les Syriens avant vous. Une tragédie pour les Russes ensuite sur lesquels Poutine referme le couvercle du cercueil de la guerre froide, une tragédie pour l'Europe, dont le travail de 30 ans de réconciliation vient de voler en éclats, et puis une tragédie pour la démocratie. Nous avons tous été unis pour répondre à cet agresseur le 25 février en décidant sa suspension. Aujourd'hui, le groupe ALDE demande solennellement l'exclusion de la Russie du Conseil de l'Europe le plus vite possible. Nous faisons le cœur lourd, car de fait, les citoyens russes perdront la protection de la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Mais nous ne les oublions pas. Une Russie démocratique rejoindra le moment venu le Conseil de l'Europe, car le peuple russe n'est pas condamné à la dictature. Ce combat contre la dictature, les Ukrainiens le mènent avec une incroyable mobilisation. Quand un peuple tout entier lutte pour son existence, l'histoire montre qu'il finit par gagner. Le gouvernement vous aide 
vous l'avez dit, avec de l'argent, avec des armes, avec des sanctions lourdes contre la nomenclatura, et ils maintiennent la ligne ouverte à la négociation. Nos familles en Europe se mobilisent aussi pour donner et pour accueillir nos voisins ukrainiens. Et ce combat, ce combat le Conseil de l'Europe y prend toute sa part. Et nous demandons que la secrétaire générale, que des représentants de notre Assemblée et du comité des ministres mobilisent ensemble tous nos moyens. C'est le sens de l'amendement que nous proposons tout à l'heure. Il faut par exemple qu'un recours soit déposé contre la Russie devant la Cour pour ce qu'elle a fait. Il faut que les leaders du Conseil de l'Europe aillent témoigner en Ukraine sur le plan politique, comme vient de le dire Maria Mezenseva. Il faut que nous puissions recueillir sur place les atteintes aux droits de l'homme pour que justice soit faite. Nous devons aussi contribuer à ce que cette vague de réfugiés puisse être gérée sans discrimination dans le respect de nos droits et de nos valeurs. Nous devons aussi accélérer et achever le travail en cours de nos rapporteurs sur la Russie pendant cette période intérimaire, sur des sujets clés comme celui des prisonniers politiques, comme celui de la légalité du mandat du président Poutine. Nous devons faire en sorte aussi que les recours pendants devant la Cour de justice puissent aller jusqu'au bout de façon prioritaire et que les six mois qui viennent puissent être aussi utilisés à fond pour que tout cela soit utile euh, aux Ukrainiens. Pour toutes ces, ces raisons, le groupe ALDE votera l'opinion qui nous est soumise aujourd'hui et il le votera conscient que c'est un message évidemment pour les Ukrainiens, c'est un message pour tous nos amis qui sont sur le front à la frontière de la Russie. Et c'est un message aussi pour tous les Européens qui ont passé un volontarisme politique énorme pendant 40 ans à créer cet espace de droit et de démocratie qui est notre plus cher élément en partage. Merci à vous. Merci à vous, Jacques. And now the last speaker on behalf of the political groups is George Katsugaros from Greece. He speaks on behalf of the UEL group. I can announce to the Assembly that George Katsugaros has been elected the new leader of the UEL uh, group uh, this, uh, this week. Uh, congratulations. You have the floor, George. Dear Chair, our organization has been the first international organization to react to the Russian invasion, as it has reacted to the Greek dictatorship in 1968. We should thank Tini, not just uh, for his recent leadership, but also for being the father of the joint procedure who gave a new role to our organization and allowed us to send this unequivocal message against the war, not just out of pacifistic reasons, but exactly because the Russian invasion was against international law, was against the fundamental values of our organization. And it was based on a historical revisionism which is very destabilizing for the whole of Europe. And we managed to sideline our differences in order to send this message. Of course, when we are going to discuss in April why Europe failed to prevent the war, why we have failed to create a new architecture of security in our common European home, our answers could be different. And this is the essence of democracy. But now the moment is not for that. Now the moment is to call for de-escalation, for more humanitarian aid to Ukraine, to ensure humanitarian corridors. The Greek consul in Mariupol, a city with 120,000 uh, Greek origin citizens, is still trapped there, among many other people who would like to find a way out of the hell there. So, we have supported the report of Mr. Chau, and I would like to thank her for that. Although we would like to have uh, some uh, issues more explicit drawn there. Above all, the support to the, Russi to the uh, peace movement throughout in Europe, and especially in Russia. The efforts of demonstrations, which have resulted to imprisonment of many Russians, Individual cases of heroism, like uh, the uh, young uh, worker in the broadcast that interrupted the program in order to send a message against war. This is necessary for sending the message 
for de-escalation and against the war, but also the message that we are not against the Russian people, but exactly the Russian illegal invasion. And, and with that, I should end. Our message should be clear. Targeted sanctions and diplomacy can end the war, not uh, prohibitions of performances of Tchaikovsky, as has happened in my country, Greece. Tchaikovsky has not invaded Ukraine. Unequivocally, in a unified way, we should all say, stop the war, protect the peace, and for the next day, avoid a new Cold War that would divide again our common European home. Thank you, uh, George. Uh, referring to what you said about the members of the international organizations who are now in Mariupol uh, under very dire conditions, I, this was brought also to my, to my attention by others, and I will see what we from our assembly could do to put emphasis on their, uh, their position. Now I call in the de debate uh, the first speaker of the list of speakers, and that's Mr. Max uh, Lux from Germany. You have the floor, Mr. Lux. Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, es ist mir eine Ehre, als neues Mitglied in dieser Versammlung auch nach mutigen Kolleginnen aus der Ukraine sprechen zu dürfen. Denn das, was wir gehört haben, zeigt ja, sie verteidigen die, ihr Land, aber sie verteidigen auch die Demokratie und die Rechtsstaatlichkeit für alle Menschen in Europa. Und dafür müssen wir ihnen dankbar sein. Wir spüren alle, das ist heute eine historische Sitzung und historisches auch, was die Europäerinnen und Europäer in dieser Zeit auch abseits der politischen Sitzungssäle zeigen. Wenn ich in meine Heimatstadt nach Bochum gucke, im Westen von Deutschland, dann sehe ich da überfüllte Lagerhallen mit Sachspenden, Menschen, die sich ehrenamtlich einbringen, um schnell Unterkünfte für Geflüchtete zu organisieren. Und diese Solidarität finden wir natürlich nicht nur bei mir, wir finden sie ganz besonders in Polen, in der Slowakei, in Rumänien, in Moldau, in all ihren Heimatstädten. Und das Ziel des Europarates war das Bauen am gemeinsamen Haus Europa, wie es Michael Gorbatschow einst formulierte. Und die russische Führung zielt mit ihrem mörderischen Angriffskrieg in der Ukraine auch auf die Zerstörung dieses gesamten gemeinsamen Hauses ab. Und trotzdem, die Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer lassen das nicht kampflos zu. Und auch auf europäischer Ebene führt Putins Krieg gegen Menschenrechte zum genauen Gegenteil, nämlich zu einem entschiedenen Eintreten der Europäerinnen und Europäer für Menschlichkeit und für Gerechtigkeit. Denn die Europäerinnen und Europäer, die wissen, das glaube ich ganz genau, dass Menschlichkeit stärker ist als jede Großmachtsfantasie, dass Menschlichkeit stärker ist, als es jeder grauenvolle Plan aus dem Kreml sein kann. Meine Damen und Herren, meine Generation ist in Deutschland in der Illusion aufgewachsen, dass nie wieder Krieg jedenfalls in Europa Realität werden kann. Und seit dem 24. Februar 2022 hat sich das geändert. Putin trifft, tritt das Völkerrecht mit Füßen und viele sagen, er zeichnet den Beginn einer neuen Epoche. Ich finde, wir sollten nicht Putin bestimmen lassen, in welche Zeit wir gemeinsam gehen. Und deshalb ist es so richtig, dass wir entschieden an der Seite der Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer stehen. Und deshalb muss es aber auch so sein, dass wir dieses Eintreten der Europäerinnen und Europäer für Menschlichkeit nutzen und auch uns dafür einsetzen, die anderen Unmenschlichkeiten in Europa, ob an den Außengrenzen, in Georgien, zu beenden. Lassen Sie uns das System Putins aus diesem Haus ausschließen, denn das System Putins ist nicht Russland. Wir sind den Ausschluss dieses Systems auch der mutigen Zivilgesellschaft in Russland schuldig, die diesen Krieg genauso wenig will. Danke schön, Herr Lux. Now I call on the debate Alberto Ribolla uh, from uh, Italy. Alberto, you have the floor. Grazie, Presidente. 
Onorevoli colleghi, innanzitutto lasciatemi esprimere la mia solidarietà alle nostre colleghe ucraine presenti in sala, che abbiamo potuto ascoltare poco fa, e ai nostri colleghi ucraini che sono dovuti rimanere in patria. Vi siamo sentitamente vicini. Il rapporto al nostro esame, per cui ringrazio la relatrice, è del tutto condivisibile e rappresenta allo Stato una ricostruzione dettagliata degli avvenimenti drammatici che si sono sviluppati sotto i nostri occhi. Non abbiamo dubbi circa il fatto che vi siano un aggressore e un aggredito e che la nostra solidarietà vada a chi subisce i bombardamenti e alle truppe di un altro Paese sul proprio territorio. L'invasione deve cessare, la diplomazia deve vincere, Va trovato al più presto un accordo politico e predisposti nel frattempo tutti gli strumenti che occorreranno per ricostruire l'Ucraina. Kiev avrà bisogno dei nostri aiuti. La nostra speranza riguarda anche le sorti dei rifugiati in fuga dalla guerra, essenzialmente anziani, donne e bambini, per i quali il mio Paese, l'Italia, sta aprendo le proprie porte con l'accoglienza e cui dovremo offrire riparo per tutto il tempo loro necessario. La pace servirà anche a restituirli alle loro case e agli uomini rimasti in patria per la necessità della difesa nazionale. Concordiamo sulla decisione di sospendere la Russia da questo nostro consesso ed anche eh, riteniamo importante che si studi come attuare le previsioni dell'articolo 8 del nostro Statuto relative al ritiro della delegazione degli Stati membri che non sia opportuno facciano parte più del Consiglio d'Europa. Dobbiamo tuttavia anche avere il coraggio di guardare oltre alla ricostruzione non solo di ciò che è stato distrutto, ma anche del tessuto connettivo tra i popoli, che viene ora così tragicamente lacerato. Ogni provvedimento che assumiamo deve essere quindi temporaneo e contingente, legato alla situazione che i russi hanno determinato scatenando il loro attacco. Dobbiamo dire che le porte di tutte le organizzazioni multilaterali come la nostra rimarranno aperte anche al popolo russo, alla Russia, ma ad una Russia diversa, che cambia atteggiamento e possibilmente anche ordine politico interno, per dar voce alle generazioni che non desiderano la violenza, ma piuttosto l'integrazione del loro Paese nel sistema internazionale. Generazioni il cui futuro viene compromesso esattamente come quello dei giovani ucraini che si trovano dall'altra parte. Nel frattempo il nostro consesso dovrà rimanere una sede di confronto e di dialogo, se non con i russi, almeno con i bielorussi, che non sono ancora coinvolti nelle operazioni e ci auguriamo caldamente che ne restino fuori. Il Consiglio d'Europa è nato come espressione di un progetto di pace, mentre sull'Europa calava già la cortina di ferro. Ne sta scendendo un'altra. La nostra funzione è più importante che mai. Dobbiamo continuare a credere nell'ideale di una pace paneuropea in cui tutti i popoli del nostro continente possano perseguire liberamente la propria realizzazione e nella quale ogni individuo possa cercare liberamente la propria felicità. Grazie. Grazie Alberto. Prochaine oratrice, madame Nicole Duraton de la France. Nicole, vous avez la parole. Merci, monsieur le président, mes chers collègues. Je veux tout d'abord réexprimer mon total soutien au peuple ukrainien, aux victimes de la guerre et à nos collègues ukrainiens qui nous ont souvent prévenus lors des sessions. Mais en vain, nous ne les avons pas écoutés, nous ne les avons pas entendus. Il nous reste maintenant d'être plus qu'à la hauteur de cette situation qui déstabilise toute l'Europe. Après la suspension des droits de représentation de la Fédération de Russie le 25 février, le comité des ministres a demandé à l'Assemblée parlementaire de rendre un avis sur l'opportunité d'inviter la Fédération de Russie à se retirer de l'organisation. Les autorités russes semble essayer de nous prendre de vitesse, puisque le porte-parole du Kremlin a lui-même évoqué un retrait du Conseil de l'Europe, tandis que le ministère des Affaires étrangères a publié un communiqué de presse infamant pour le Conseil de l'Europe. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer l'intolérable. La Fédération de Russie assumera ainsi elle-même les conséquences de ses actes mais elle n'a pas pour autant procédé à une notification officielle de ce retrait pour le moment. Hier, nous avons évoqué avec le représentant de la présidence du comité des ministres et avec la secrétaire générale les conséquences d'un éventuel retrait. Conséquences pour le peuple russe, pour la société civile russe qui ne pourra plus faire appel à la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Conséquences pour les personnes vivant sur le territoire occupé par la Fédération de Russie. Certes, ces conséquences ne doivent pas être sous-estimées, 
Mais le chemin difficile sur lequel nous sommes désarmés, engagés, nous ne l'avons pas choisi. C'est le président de la Fédération de Russie. C'est lui qui a progressivement déconnecté la Fédération de Russie des valeurs du Conseil de l'Europe. C'est lui qui a amassé les troupes russes en vue d'une invasion planifiée de l'Ukraine. Ce sont les armées de la Fédération de Russie qui attaquent les civils, qui bombardent les hôpitaux, qui violent les droits humains. Alors oui, aujourd'hui, nous ne pouvons pas en rester là. La Fédération de Russie ne peut plus en état rester membre du Conseil de l'Europe. Vladimir Poutine a bafoué les valeurs de notre institution. Nous ne pouvons pas nous laisser piétiner. Je forme le vœu que nos amis ukrainiens puissent retrouver rapidement leur pays, que les négociations en cours débouchent sur un cessez-le-feu et que les réfugiés puissent en sécurité retrouver leur pays. Je vous remercie. Merci à vous, Nicole. Uh, now I call in the debate Madame Marta Grande from Italy. Marta, you have the floor. Buongiorno a tutti, spero che mi sentiate. Mi sente, Presidente. Loud and clear, Marta. Potete sentirmi? Loud and clear, yes. Perfetto. Buongiorno a tutti i colleghi, grazie Presidente per la parola. Io intervengo um, legandomi un po' a quello che sarebbe stato anche il mio intervento di ieri. Uh, purtroppo la situazione politica che ci troviamo ad affrontare è assolutamente disarmante e sconvolgente per tutti noi, soprattutto per la nostra istituzione che si fonda uh, sui principi dello Stato di diritto, della democrazia, delle libertà individuali. È importante per proprio per questo motivo che il Consiglio d'Europa abbia preso una decisione immediatamente, la prima forse istituzione ad aver preso una decisione così importante in poco tempo. La domanda però che vorrei sottoporre all'Assemblea e quindi lasciare anche ai colleghi e in discussione eh, appunto al resto delle delegazioni è questa. Um, a mio avviso dovremmo iniziare a riflettere anche su quali possono essere le ripercussioni um, dell'appartenenza della Russia al Consiglio d'Europa relativamente all'adesione alla CEDU. I diritti che noi uh, difendiamo, noi stiamo continuando a difenderli. Uh, loro purtroppo hanno violato alcuni dei principi fondamentali della, della nostra istituzione, ma questo non deve accadere da parte nostra. Questo per dire cosa? Per dire che credo che sia fondamentale continuare a sottolineare, a sottolineare le gravissime violazioni che sono in corso oramai da più di due settimane, ma allo stesso tempo cercare di tutelare quanti più cittadini possibili attraverso la uh, procedura binding del, uh, della CEDU. Credo che questo sia fondamentale e voglio appunto lasciarlo all'Assemblea come una, un pensiero aperto che può essere sicuramente sviscerato e discusso uh, durante questa giornata di riflessione. Grazie. Thank you very much, uh, Martha. Now I call in the debate Madame Heike Engelhardt from Germany. Heike, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, I will continue now in German. Besonders begrüße ich auch unsere ukrainischen Kolleginnen, die uns gestern und heute über die Lage in der Ukraine aufgeklärt haben. Sie lassen uns direkt und unmittelbar an den fürchterlichen Geschehnissen teilhaben. Und deshalb möchte ich zunächst meine Solidarität und mein Mitgefühl mit der Ukraine und den Menschen deutlich machen. Was momentan passiert, ist schrecklich. Die Bilder des Krieges werden für immer in unseren Gedächtnissen bleiben. Wer in den vergangenen zwei Wochen am Berliner Hauptbahnhof war, kennt auch ein weiteres Bild. Das Bild der ukrainischen Flüchtlinge, meistens Frauen und Kinder. Viele dieser Frauen auf der Flucht haben Kinder dabei oder sind schwanger. Es wird schnell klar, dass die gesundheitliche Versorgung dieser Geflüchteten mangelhaft und nicht ausreichend ist. Geflüchtete kommen ohne gesundheitliche Fürsorge oder Betreuungen in den Fluchtländern an. Gerade bei schwangeren Frauen ist dies hochproblematisch. Frauen auf der Flucht können nicht darauf vertrauen, medizinisch versorgt zu werden und müssen oft selber Maßnahmen ergreifen, um ihre auch ungeborenen Kinder zu beschützen. 
wir in Deutschland, das verspreche ich Ihnen als Mitglied des Gesundheitsausschusses im Deutschen Bundestag, wir in Deutschland werden alles dafür tun, dass sie die bestmögliche Behandlung erhalten. Und das werden die anderen Staaten genauso machen, davon bin ich überzeugt. Die gesundheitliche Versorgung ist natürlich nicht nur bei den Geflüchteten ungenügend. Auch vor Ort in der Ukraine ist die Gesundheitsversorgung besorgniserregend. Wir haben es heute mehrfach schon gehört, in Mariupol wurde eine Geburtsklinik angegriffen. In der Tat, es gab einen Angriff auf schwangere Frauen, auf ÄrztInnen und KrankenpflegerInnen, die selbstlos für die Gesundheit der ukrainischen Frauen arbeiten. Das Bild einer schwangeren Frau und ihres ungeborenen Kindes, die dabei umgekommen sind, geht um die Welt. Ein Ort, an dem Zivilisten sich sicher fühlen sollten, in der sich schwangere Frauen keine Sorgen um sich selber und ihre ungeborenen Kinder machen sollten, wurden zum Opfer russischer Aggressionen. Millionen von Ukrainerinnen und insbesondere schwangere Frauen können momentan nicht auf ihr Grundrecht medizinisch versorgt werden, zugreifen. Wir haben gestern und heute in der Europaratssitzung viele wichtige Themen dieses Ukraine-Krieges angesprochen. Lassen Sie uns, lasst uns die gesundheitliche Versorgung der Geflüchteten und der Menschen vor Ort, insbesondere der schwangeren Frauen, nicht in dieser Diskussion vergessen. Lassen Sie uns nun entschlossen und gemeinschaftlich dem Aggressor entgegnen. Wer so eklatant die Menschenrechte und das Völkerrecht missachtet, der hat in unserem Kreis nichts verloren. Die Lösung kann nur sein, wir müssen Russland aus dem Europarat, so schwer es uns fällt, ausschließen. Vielen Dank. Slava Ukraini. Danke sehr, Frau Engelhardt. Now I call on the debate Madam Katja Polidori from Italy. Katja, you have the floor. She is not any longer on our list, so now I call on the debate Mr. Joseph Juratovic from, uh, German, from Germany. We also do not have Mr. Juratovic with us. Now I, I give the floor to Peter Omsig from the Netherlands. Peter, you have the word. Thank you. And when this organization was founded in 1949, in the original meeting, Churchill held a speech and started. Throughout our long history, we've triumphed over the perils of religious wars, of dynastic wars, after 30 years of conflict. I'm confident that we have now reached the end of nationalist wars. After all our victories and all our suffering, are we now to founder an ultimate chaos in ideological wars triggered by barbarous, lawless oligarchies? These words are more true today than we could have imagined. This organization was founded on the principle of human rights for everyone. And the basic human rights is that there is no war, no war in which you get yourself involved in. And there is a full-scale war of aggression with bombardments of entire cities by the Russians. It also means that we have to look at ourselves. Diplomacy has failed. We sent the wrong signals to Russia. After the occupation of Crimea and of the Donbas, and our colleagues of Ukraine, Georgia, but also of the Baltic Republics, have warned us repeatedly for that, we lifted the sanctions in 2018, and reinstatement of Russia was the result. That was a wrong decision. We now have to draw a very clear line. If we keep Russia as a member, even as a member without voting rights, we will insult each and every citizen of the Ukraine. For they are under constant bombardments. And we cannot allow Russia to remain within this organization which is built on the rule of law. It has to start to obey international law. And it's very sad but if expulsion doesn't happen quickly, we lose credibility. We lose all credibility for the human rights in every other nation of this organization. 
Yes, there should be channels of diplomacy, maybe at the OSCE, and I hope the channels of diplomacy are a little bit more silent so they can do their work. But they shouldn't be here proclaiming that they're a member of the International Organization of Democratic Societies. Because under Putin, Russia is not. Thank you. Thank you all, uh, Peter. Now I call in the debate Madam Yulia Ovshinikova from Ukraine. Yulia, you have the floor. Dear ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Are you okay? Are you safe? Formal, formal questions, right? But for the millions of Ukrainians, this simple question became the most important routine in the morning, in the family's chat, in the friends' messages, in the neighbor's call. You are really lucky if you hear, yes, I'm okay. I haven't heard this word from my godmother, which in Mariupol now. So personally, I experienced this twice as a double internally displaced person. First in Donetsk in 2014 and now. Today, the new day of the war in Europe. In the 21st century, all medieval barbarian war, new day of death, and destruction of Ukraine. Hano's breach of human rights, indiscriminate attacks on the civilians in civilian infrastructure, purposeful attacks and occupation of the nuclear power plants in Energodar and Chernobyl, kidnapping mayors of Ukrainian cities, manipulating and attacking of the green corridors, murdering people in Mariupol, etc. This list of grey war crimes to be continued. So the war is already in Europe, and Europe is already in this war, financially, socially, politically. And the whole world is united support of our country. It's incredible and fantastic solidarity. All countries standing with us. Thank you, Europeans people. Thank you, people and governments all over the globe. So the goal why we are here in the Council of Europe was the idea that the of peace based upon just and international cooperation is vital for the preservation of human society and civilization. We failed the peace. Genocide and ecocide called denationalization and demilitarization is again being committed in Europe by one of the members of United Nations and Council of Europe. But we still have a chance to revive the core mission of peace, to protect peace and fight for human rights right now, right here, for Ukraine and for Ukrainian peoples. Russia must be banned and expelled from all the international communities and organizations. Russia don't have any moral right to belong to the, our family until they pay for the crime legally, financially, morally. Unfortunately, thousands of deaths, millions of broken lives and lost homes, hundreds of destroyed cities in our country, in the heart of Europe, cannot be forgiven. Just cannot, for now. To tell the truth, it's too early to talk about consequence of the war aggression of Russia, because first, we need to win. Ukraine needs no-fly zone, weapons, airplanes, to end this war and this terrible humanitarian catastrophe. Give us, please, this, and we win with the one week. Then we, the global democratic coalition of Europe, global community, will reestablish peace and new security order. We pay a very high price for our freedom. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, uh, Yulia. <laughs> now I call in the debate. Mr. Ahmed Yildiz from Turkey. Ahmed, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Without repeating the previous speakers, indeed we are united on what we are doing here. Let me begin by congratulating and appreciating the resilience and bravery of the Ukrainian people in defending their country. 
Now they deserve our united solidarity and Russia, which violated, breached all international rules and made a big harm to the international order. It deserves a united response from us. Dear colleagues, in, since 2014, right after the an illegal annexation of Crimea and occupation of parts of other Ukrainian territories, my country and some other countries, international community as a whole, tried all good offices, all, all ways to solve this issue in the context of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, but Russia failed all initiatives. Now, Ukrainian people resisting this occupation, this all-out war, uh, with unfounded uh, arguments reflecting a strange mindset. Now, we must help Ukrainian people in addressing the consequences of uh, this war waged on them uh, unjustly. The first display, of course, is uh, migration, refugees, and bombing of the cities, indiscriminate bombing of the urban areas. Uh, my country, Italy, and others have a lot of experience from the last years uh, of immigration from south. We can share this experience with the neighboring countries, Poland, Romania, how to address it. And Turkish missions in Ukraine, embassy and consular missions will continue their work. They evacuated so many. They will stay there until the last moment. Uh, but this uh, war, uh, right during the uh, last years of pandemic, was, uh, I think, pre-planned before. Uh, the justification by Russians on NATO security, these are all unfounded. So our response should be clear and united. On uh, humanitarian corridors and on uh, helping the refugees without any discrimination, unfortunately we see some, we should be united on our values and on our response. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, now I call on the debate, Mr. Piero Fassino from Italy. Piero, you have the floor. Pronto, grazie. Mi ascoltate, sì. Yes, Piero, grazie, we hear you. Grazie, Presidente. Io mi scuso se mi collego online, ma oggi il nostro Parlamento vota il decreto di aiuti all'Ucraina. <coughs> all e quindi devo essere qui per votare. E mi collegherò online anche per votare la nostra risoluzione. Io credo che la decisione che stiamo assumendo è una decisione assolutamente necessaria e inevitabile. Non c'è nessuna giustificazione a quello che ha fatto Putin. La Russia non ha ricevuto nessuna minaccia né dall'Ucraina, né dall'Europa, né dagli Stati Uniti, né dalla Nato. Eh, la, Russia, la Russia sta stracciando tutti gli accordi che prevedono il rispetto dell'integrità territoriale degli Stati, la loro indipendenza, la loro sovranità. Eh, è assolutamente assurdo voler ripristinare la teoria delle sovranità limitate, una sfera di influenza che subordina la sovranità degli stati confinanti con la Russia agli interessi della Russia. E infine c'è soprattutto il fatto che questa guerra sta violando ogni diritto umano, ogni diritto civile, in una, davvero in una aggressione che non ha nessuna giustificazione. Per questo io penso che sia assolutamente inevitabile e necessaria la decisione di... Eh, escludere la Russia dal nostro, dalla nostra organizzazione e di chiederle di ritirarsi. Eh, inevitabile e necessario, e io naturalmente come tutti la voterò questa sera, questa decisione, non significa però non vedere anche una serie di questioni e di problemi che rimangono aperti. Rimane aperto il problema della tutela dei cittadini russi di fronte alla Corte di Giustizia, Rimane aperta il rischio di un isolamento dell'opposizione democratica, quell'opposizione che in questi giorni, in queste settimane ha dato luogo a tante manifestazioni contro la guerra, eh, rendendo visibile che Putin non è riuscito neanche a consolidare il consenso interno come si proponeva. E rimane aperto un problema di rappresentatività della nostra organizzazione che è 
l'organizzazione che riunisce i 47 paesi del continente europeo e che può agire ed è efficace in quanto abbia una rappresentanza universale. Quindi noi piglieremo questa sera la decisione, ripeto, questa decisione è inevitabile e necessaria perché è in gioco la nostra credibilità e sono in gioco i valori fondamentali della nostra organizzazione. Dovremo, rende, dovremo individuare quali possano essere gli strumenti per garantire in qualche modo la tutela dei cittadini russi eh, di fronte alla Corte di Giustizia e soprattutto come mantenere aperti dei canali di relazione con la società civile russa e con le forze di opposizione. Grazie a lei, Presidente. Thank you very much, Piero. Now I call on the debate Joseph O'Reilly from Ireland. Joseph, you have the floor. Thank you, President. Our Council of Europe, founded in 1949, was born out of the ashes, barbarity and nihilism of World War II. It was designed to protect human rights, democracy and the rule of law. I'm proud that Ireland was one of the first 10 signatory countries. Russia has lost the moral, the legal and the political right to be here. Bombing of residential areas, hospitals and grossly mater maternity hospitals, mass civilian casualties, hunger, destitution and displacement say it all. More than 2.5 million refugees. I'm proud that my country welcomes Ukrainian people unconditionally. Upon arrival on Irish soil, they have the same rights and privileges as any Irish citizen, eh, and we're proud of that. The testimonies of our Ukrainian colleagues are heartrending, and they challenge us. We cannot be ambiguous or equivocal. The Committee of Ministers have correctly invoked Article 8, suspending Russian membership. Under the joint procedure, they are now seeking our opinion. Today, we are giving the Council of Ministers an unambiguous and unequivocal message. Russia, by their actions, have expelled themselves. We want the Council of Ministers to give that practical expression and expel Russia. 141 member states of the United Nations have done the same, have, have uh, rather condemned the acts of aggression by Russia. The EU, another important international body, have joined with the United States and the UK and countries around the world in a set of important sanctions. And I'm proud, of course, that my country is part of that too. And let's not make one error here. Not, let's not condemn the Russian people, the ordinary Russian citizens who we are proud to have in our own countries, who we are proud to have across Europe, and who live uh, under duress and live in this oppressive regime, under this oppressive regime. We stand in solidarity with those Russians who engaged in anti-war protests, with that woman who came on our television screens last night. Ordinary Russian citizens are prisoners too, but the real victims at the moment are Ukrainian people. And we stand by Ukrainian people to the end. We want Russia have expelled themselves. Let's give that legal expression immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Now I call in a debate Mr. Andrei Hunko from Germany. Andrei, you have the floor. Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Es war in dieser Versammlung im Juni 1989, als Michael Gorbatschow die Perspektive eines gemeinsamen europäischen Hauses formuliert hat, lange vor dem Fall der Berliner Mauer und dem Umbruch in Osteuropa. Und der 24. Februar ist nicht nur ein schwarzer Tag für die Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer, natürlich für die Menschen dort besonders, Aber er ist auch ein schwarzer Tag für diese Perspektive, für die Perspektive eines gemeinsamen europäischen Hauses. Und wir stehen am Rand eines neuen eisernen Vorhangs durch Europa und dafür trägt dieser Krieg und trägt die russische Führung und Putin die alleinige Verantwortung. Ich gehöre zu den wenigen Abgeordneten, die im April 2014 
gegen die Sanktionierung der russischen Abgeordneten gestimmt haben. Das hatte verschiedene Gründe. Auch, das, dass es eine Sanktionierung war, die keinen Sinn machte. Ja, wir haben ja lange einen Prozess danach gehabt äh, und einen Joint Mechanismen, Mechanismus äh, entwickelt, äh, unter Leitung von, äh, auch auf Anregung von Tini Cox. Und ich will ganz klar sagen, ich werde dieses Mal nicht gegen diese Resolution stimmen, sondern dafür stimmen, weil dieser Krieg nicht zu rechtfertigen ist. Und das will ich sehr deutlich hier sagen. Und weil wir einen Mechanismus haben, der auch wirklich greift. Ich möchte mich aber hier auch wenden an die russische Zivilgesellschaft, an die Menschen, die mutig protestieren gegenwärtig, auf die Straße gehen, es riskieren, verhaftet zu werden, an die junge Kollegin aus dem staatlichen Fernsehen gestern, die mit einem Schild No to War äh, glaubt nicht die Lügen, äh, ihr, ihr, auch ihr Leben ein Stück weit, ihre, ihren Job und so weiter riskiert hat. Und ich glaube, es ist wichtig, dass wir auch ein Signal senden an die Menschen in Russland, die diesen Krieg nicht wollen. Das ist anders als 2014. 2014 gab es eine patriotische Welle in Russland. Im Augenblick gibt es eine tiefe Verunsicherung und keine zu große Zustimmung für diesen Krieg. Und ich glaube, es ist wichtig, dass wir uns auch an die russische Antikriegsbewegung, natürlich auch an alle Friedensbewegungen, äh, äh, aber insbesondere an die russische wenden und sehr klar sagen, Macht weiter, wir unterstützen euch, soweit wir das können. Und ich habe auch mit Laura Castell zusammen eine Written Declaration hier eingebracht, die genau dieses Signal senden will. Und ich bitte auch viele, das zu unterstützen. Vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit. Danke sehr, André. Prochain Orateur, Monsieur Stéphane Bergeron de la Canada. Stéphane, vous avez la parole. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Très bien, très bien. Super. Alors, chers collègues, ces dernières semaines, nous avons assisté avec indignation à la violence insensée perpétrée contre le peuple ukrainien par les forces armées russes. Des rapports crédibles laissent entendre que des armes dont l'usage est réprouvé, dont des bombes à sous-munitions, auraient été employées non seulement contre des objectifs militaires en Ukraine, mais également contre des établissements civils, voire des quartiers résidentiels. Les allégations de crimes de guerre et de crimes contre l'humanité se multiplient et nous inquiètent. Pendant ce temps, des dizaines de milliers d'Ukrainiens risquent littéralement leur vie chaque jour pour fuir les zones de combat et trouver refuge dans les pays limitrophes, tandis que des centaines de manifestants pacifiques sont arrêtés quotidiennement en Russie alors que la répression s'intensifie contre toute forme d'opposition au régime autoritaire de Vladimir Poutine. Tout cela vient ébranler nos valeurs fondamentales ainsi que notre foi en l'humanité et dans les mécanismes que nous avons collectivement mis en place après la Seconde Guerre mondiale pour éviter à notre monde de devoir à nouveau composer avec les affres de la guerre. Nous assistons à la fois attristés, indignés, inquiets et en colère aux nombreuses pertes de vies humaines et aux destructions découlant de l'offensive russe, mais aussi admiratifs et inspirés au courage et à la résilience dont le peuple ukrainien ne cesse de faire preuve depuis le début de l'invasion. Au Canada et au Québec, où vit la plus grande diaspora ukrainienne après la Russie, ces sentiments sont ressentis avec une acuité toute particulière. Peut-être aurait-il été nécessaire d'exercer davantage de, sanctions, de pression, dis-je, sur la Russie en amont, notamment par le biais de sanctions, comme le suggérait Alexei Navalny ou Bill Browder, de telle sorte d'essayer de prévenir une telle tragédie, mais bien malin celui qui est en mesure de dire qui aurait pu, ce qui aurait pu dissuader le président Poutine de mener à bien ces visées belliqueuses. Aussi, n'avons-nous eu d'autre choix que de réagir à cette agression totalement injustifiée. Je tiens donc à saluer la réaction rapide du Conseil de l'Europe et la décision de suspendre les droits de représentation de la Russie, car ces actions sont clairement, ont clairement violé l'article 3 du statut du Conseil de l'Europe. Il y a plus de 70 ans, dans un discours prononcé devant cette Assemblée, Winston Churchill a dit, et je cite, 
qu'un sentiment de courage et d'unité doit nous inspirer. Jusqu'à présent, j'ai été impressionné par le... et encouragé, dis-je, par l'unité affichée par l'immense majorité des pays membres du Conseil de l'Europe, et plus encore, par le courage manifesté par certains d'entre eux qui ont le plus à perdre de la patrie de sanctions déployées jusqu'à présent, d'autant qu'il nous faut encore aller plus loin pour forcer la Russie à mettre enfin un terme à cette agression totalement injustifiée. Personne n'ose prétendre que l'issue est imminente, car comme le disait un autre illustre parlementaire, Georges Clémenceau, et je cite, « Il est plus facile de faire la guerre que la paix. » Faudra donc faire preuve d'une unité et d'un courage toujours plus inébranlable, mais l'exemple admirable de la résistance héroïque du peuple ukrainien doit continuer à nous inspirer. Merci de votre attention. Slava Ukraini. Merci, monsieur. Je passe la parole maintenant à monsieur Howell. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to start by giving my warmest congratulations to the rapporteur and to the Political Affairs Committee. I've uh, attended meetings of the Political Affairs Committee, and I've been struck by one thing and one thing above all, and that is how this issue has united us across political parties. It, it is difficult to get a cigarette paper between members of the socialist group and my own group, and that is how it should be. I think this is a good and hard and definitive conclusion to the report. And um, I, I, I would say that, that, that my motivation uh, behind all of this has been driven to ensure that Russia is finally expelled from this council. Personally, I cannot wait for the flag to be taken down outside this building, the Russian flag to be taken down. We have been warning in my group for some time that the Russian Federation has been trouble for us all, and so it has proved. We have tried to build bridges, um, and those, unfortunately, have not worked. As, as, as Russia is self-interested, and it, it is, it, it, and it is so more than any other countries. My feelings towards Ukraine are very strong. I wear this, this, this ribbon with great pride. And um, what, what I see around the world in all of this is the largest packet of sanctions that we have ever put on a country. And I think that one of the things that I would draw particular attention to is the level of international support that we have tried to help together uh, to gather for, uh, for, for this act uh, um, to, to bring Russia uh, to account. But this picture is, the, 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 this report is not just about the big picture of the situation in, in Ukraine. The opinion on it is more focused on providing what we can do to help the Council of Ministers to come to a decision uh, about expelling Russia. And I believe that we have done that very well. I hope that this will be the first stage in a much better relationship between PACE and the Council of Ministers. I think we have worked well together and are continuing to work well together and I hope that that will continue uh, for the future. I hope it will, too, help those countries who are at the moment unsure, and I hope that it will bring them to the table to vote for this motion. Merci, monsieur. Je, je donne la parole maintenant à madame Pollat, qui est en ligne pour l'Allemagne. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Es ist wichtig, ein starkes und geschlossenes Signal aus dieser parlamentarischen Versammlung mit dieser Resolution zu senden und Russland nicht nur international zu isolieren, sondern auch unsere Menschenrechte zu verteidigen. Unsere deutsche Außenministerin Annalena Baerbock hat auf der 49. Menschenrechtstagung richtigerweise betont, ich zitiere, Menschenrechte sind grundlegend für unsere Existenz. Und wenn sie versagt werden, sind wir in unserer Existenz bedroht. Ja, wir sind beeindruckt über den Mut und die Widerstandskraft 
der UkrainerInnen, die nicht zuletzt mit Grund für die Geschlossenheit Europas und der internationalen Gemeinschaft sind. Die Geschlossenheit, die Solidarität, mit der Europa und die große Mehrheit der internationalen Gemeinschaft auf Putins Krieg reagieren, sind ermutigend. Ermutigen auch in Mensch, auch in Russland Menschen auf die Straße zu gehen und gegen den Angriffskrieg zu protestieren. Respekt und Dank allen Staaten und vor allem auch vielen Familien, privaten Initiativen, die jetzt schnell und unbürokratisch helfen, Menschen aus der Ukraine aufzunehmen und Schutz zu geben, Hilfspakete schnüren, um zu helfen. Länder wie Polen, Moldau, Rumänien, Tschechien, die Slowakei leisten viel. Das ist bewundernswert. Aber bei einem Lob darf es natürlich nicht bleiben. Europa als Ganzes muss Solidarität zeigen und solidarisch bleiben. Ermutigend, dass die Europäische Union erstmals die Richtlinie für den vorübergehenden Schutz aktiviert hat und so geschlossen wie noch nie in einer Flüchtlingsfrage gehandelt hat. Alle Menschen aus der Ukraine müssen Zugang zu Gesundheitsleistungen bekommen, zum Arbeitsmarkt. Die Kinder müssen unterrichtet werden, solange der Albtraum anhält in ihrer neuen Heimat oder vielleicht vorübergehend dort, wo sie Schutz finden. Wichtig ist uns nochmal auch hier in diesem Rahmen zu betonen, das gilt für alle Menschen, unabhängig von der Staatsangehörigkeit und unabhängig von ihrem Status. Und ich, die auch zuständig bin in Deutschland für die Minderheit der Roma und Sinti, auch für die Roma-Minderheit aus der Ukraine, muss das uneingeschränkt in ganz Europa gelten. In diesem Sinne möchte ich auch mich und für unsere Delegation mich solidarisch erklären mit der ukrainischen Delegation, Ihnen viel Kraft wünschen, Slava Ukraina. Merci, Madame. La parole est maintenant à Madame Bakoyanis de Grèce, qui est en ligne aussi. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, today is an historic moment for our organization, a moment of action, but also of reflection. Putin's aggression against Ukraine's territorial integrity, against its democracy and its people, and the 150,000 Greeks in Mariupol has no excuse, no ground for justification. It is an act that contradicts international law, contradicts international order, an act that takes Europe back 70 years. Our message is clear. There can be no place for a member state that does not respect our values, doesn't uphold human rights and freedom. There can be no place for a state who chooses war over peace. The draft opinion prepared by Madame Shu and the Secretariat team was supported with unity at the political committee yesterday. And I want to thank her for carrying out such a difficult task. We stand united today in this extraordinary session in solidarity with Ukraine, sending a clear message Europe is stronger and determined to stand tough and tall against any violation of our order, our values, our peaceful way of life. This can be a moment of reflection as well. Russia's aggression should awaken us all. Revisionism, expansionism, desire to redraw borders and to rule under an iron feast, such ideas haven't perished. They live in the ambitions of some and now actively undermine peace. The Council of Europe bears the legitimacy and gravity of an organization that safeguards democracy and human rights for the prosperity and well-being of the people we represent. In times like this, we need to reaffirm our conviction and trust in our values. We need to remain vigilant and set an example for all Europe and all the world. Freedom is not a luxury or an ideology that can perish easily. Democracy and freedom are a choice, one to be championed, erga omnes. Thank you. 
Merci, madame. Alors, j'appelle maintenant M. Gatelin en ligne pour la France. Oui, merci, madame la présidente. Mes chers collègues, notre honorable collègue Piero Fassino l'a dit avec des mots et des mots parfaits, avec la mesure et l'intelligence qui le caractérise, nous sommes face à une décision qui est désormais incontournable. Ne pas voter aujourd'hui l'exclusion ou un avis d'exclusion de la Fédération de Russie reviendrait à donner un blanc sein aux dirigeants du Kremlin à l'abolition de toutes les règles qui président à notre organisation. Ce serait un blanc sein à une guerre injuste, sale, dégueulasse, une guerre systématiquement non conventionnelle, où nous bombardons des maternités, des hôpitaux, des populations civiles, où il y a usage de bombes à sous-munitions. Ce serait également donner un blanc-seing à d'éventuelles futures attaques contre d'autres membres par entière partie de notre organisation. Ne pas le faire, ce ne serait pas seulement être un aveu de faiblesse, mais ce serait également une perte de sens total pour notre organisation. Ce serait un signe de démission, un permis de tuer, tuer donné aux dirigeants de la Fédération de Russie actuellement. Il y a trois ans, en réintégrant la Fédération du, de, de Russie au sein de l'Assemblée euh, parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, nous avons offert une chance à celle-ci de re-rentrer dans le droit et dans les règles internationales. Le pays n'en a pas tenu compte. Aujourd'hui, j'ai une pensée, bien évidemment, pour tous les opposants démocrates russes. J'ai une pensée encore plus vive et plus forte pour nos collègues ukrainiens. Et je voudrais lancer ici un appel aussi à nos collègues de la Turquie. Nous avons parfois... Des, divergences, des divergences, des différences. Mais aujourd'hui, ce pays doit prendre conscience qu'il est de plus en plus enserré, entouré par les alliés de la Fédération de Russie. Et donc, nous devons agir ensemble, unanimement, pour nous protéger, pour protéger les peuples ukrainiens et ses dirigeants et ses représentants. Nous devons surtout agir pour nous protéger en excluant la Fédération du Russie et du Conseil de l'Europe. Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à madame Bilozir d'Ukraine. Thank you, madame president, dear colleagues. Today, war is in our common European house. Aggressor has come to our home to ruin, to injure and kill our children and women. It's not only an attack on Ukraine, it's an attack on Europe's security system. And Ukraine is paying by life of our nation. All of us, nine women from Ukraine delegation, came to pace from Ukraine that turned to a sea of human misery, but also a sea of dignity and struggle. It took me more than two days to get here with my children. They are in hemicycle today with us, Please meet Anna Maria and Lisa. They lost their home, everything that they had, their beloved pets, books, things. They don't go to school. They suffer severe panic attacks. All they have is Ukrainian forces, armed forces, and me to protect them. But as all Ukrainians, also state and local authorities, We parliamentarians are also a threat to be eliminated, kidnapped and killed. I am happy that my children can spend one more day here in peaceful Strasbourg. But tomorrow we will return to Ukraine, where Russians turn our life to nightmare, where we hide in bomb shelters, metros, where air alarm sirens almost each hour in each town. There are no safe place anymore in Ukraine. Each city is a threat. Russia filed, fired almost 1,000 cruise and ballistic missiles at Ukraine during these 20 days. 
Russian enemy came to our home trying to, lead, to delete us from the, from the earth and map to delete my 40 million nation with cassette, vacuum, thermobaric, phosphorus bombs and missiles forbidden by the Geneva Convention. Convention. If we will not stop Putin, I am sure they will, there will be more biological, chemical, nuclear weapon. Today we have killed children, destroyed hospitals, bombed maternity hospitals, people buried in mass graves. Can you imagine? In Mariupol, they are buried in mass graves. Authorities say the number of victims in Mariupol is approaching 20,000 people. Here in Pace, it was a constant line of policy of appeasement of regressor under pretext of dialogue. And uh, there are many ifs that not every man among European politicians would like to hear. But if such unprecedented session as today would be imposed in 2014, if Russia would not be welcomed back in 2019 to assembly, there would be no probably no strong aggressor today that all of these eight years was invited here to dialogue but was preparing to war. We have to give today a clear message to the world. Russia is agri aggressor aggressive. It cannot be a member of PACE anymore. We need a stronger and united Europe to take strong decisions and to take this responsibility. Thank you. Merci, madame. Je donne désormais la parole à monsieur Rampi d'Italy. Sì. Signora Presidente, non è facile parlare oggi in quest'Aula parlare dopo le parole che abbiamo sentito, parlare ed essere all'altezza di queste bambine che sono qua dietro a noi e pensare se è questo il mondo che abbiamo creato, per citare un grande artista europeo, se è un mondo in cui ancora le bambine e i bambini muoiono a pochi chilometri da noi sotto le bombe, come pensavamo che non sarebbe successo più, perché quando è nata questa istituzione in questa città, che è una città martire, è una città che è stata sotto le bombe. A pochi chilometri da qua c'era un confine, ed era il confine in cui per due volte le nazioni del mondo si sono uccise tra loro. E poi quando è nata questa istituzione in questa città abbiamo veramente creduto che quel confine non avesse più ragione d'essere. L'ho attraversato questa domenica, questo confine, e nemmeno ti accorgi più se non perché cambia il segnale del cellulare. Ecco, noi saremo all'altezza di questo. Noi oggi prendiamo atto di un fatto drammatico, cioè una risoluzione che contiene un fallimento e che contiene però anche delle parole di speranza e degli impegni, degli impegni di aiuto. Io testimonio come nel mio Paese, in queste ore, tante persone che conosco si muovono, organizzano aiuti, prendono le loro macchine, i loro pullman, i loro camper, le loro vacanze per andare in Polonia, in Ucraina, ad aiutare queste persone. Questo è il pezzo dell'umanità che noi dobbiamo rappresentare. Noi dobbiamo pensare e dobbiamo capire se siamo in grado di creare un Consiglio d'Europa che sappia unire questi popoli in questo modo, che sappia dire definitivamente no, non solo alla guerra, ma a ciò che la guerra crea, cioè alle dittature e ai dittatori. Noi abbiamo approvato una risoluzione qualche mese fa in questa assemblea sul diritto alla conoscenza che diceva qualcosa di importante, cioè che noi dobbiamo dare ai popoli gli strumenti per scegliere chi li guida, per scegliere bene chi li guida. Noi dobbiamo cacciare il nazionalismo da tutte le comunità europee e costruire qualche cosa di nuovo insieme. Ecco, oggi inizia un cammino. La guerra in Ucraina deve finire domani e ogni giorno è una vittima in più. E finita questa guerra, noi dovremo provare a costruire sulla consapevolezza di questa esperienza qualche cosa di nuovo. Io sono stato a Sarajevo qualche anno dopo aver aiutato quelle persone durante la guerra, perché l'Italia è stata generosa in quel caso come è stata generosa oggi sull'Ucraina. Noi non abbiamo imparato quella lezione. Qualcuno ha citato Mikhail Gorbachev. Beh, noi in quegli anni, a cui va il mio personale omaggio, a questa grande, straordinaria figura, noi non siamo stati all'altezza del suo messaggio. E allora, colleghi, e chiudo davvero, proviamo ad essere all'altezza del momento storico che stiamo attraversando e facciamolo 
per queste due bambine che sono qua di fianco a me. Merci, monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à monsieur Stier de Croatie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, this war of aggression against Ukraine launched by the Russian Federation is a defining moment for all of us. It's a defining moment for Europe and for the Council of Europe. Because let's make no mistake about it. This war of aggression against Ukraine is also an aggression against the principles upon which this Council of Europe was founded. As an organization, as part of the architecture of peace after the Second World War, that tried to replace the logics of confrontation with the logic of cooperation, of defense of human rights, of defense of democracy. And this is under aggression today. Because what we are seeing from Mr. Putin for quite a long time now is that he wants to go back to the logic of confrontation, of confronting spheres of influence. He wants to create its Russian world, its own sphere of influence. We saw that in Transnistria and Moldova. We saw that in 2008 in Georgia. We saw that in 2014 in Ukraine and now with a total war against Ukraine. And there is a big danger because that could be also imitated. Just look at the countries, at the committee of ministers that didn't vote for the activation of Article 8. Look at that list. Coming from Croatia, unfortunately, we experienced war also in the 90s. We know what is the attempt of creating a sphere of influence. And that's why I also take this opportunity to say we need to stand for the independence, the territorial integrity, and the sovereignty of Montenegro, of Kosovo, of Northern Macedonia, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. All of the countries in the Western Balkans should be thinking of acceding to the European Union and the doors of the EU should be open for them. No one should be thinking along the lines of creating a sphere of influence. And at this defining moment, dear colleagues, there is no more room for non-alignments. This is a moment where we should act without hesitation. We should send a very clear message to the Committee of Ministers that in the name of the victims of the city of Mary, of Mariupol, we need to expel the Russian Federation from the Council of Europe, and we need to do it now. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. La parole est maintenant à Monsieur Lenay de France. Madame la Présidente, mes chers collègues, les travaux de notre Assemblée sont marqués depuis 2014 par les actions de la Fédération de Russie. Notre Assemblée a régulièrement constaté ses manquements aux obligations contractées lors de son adhésion à notre organisation en 1996. L'annexion de la Crimée par la force a marqué un véritable tournant qui a abouti à une suspension des droits des parlementaires russes au sein de notre Assemblée. Malgré nos efforts pour renoncer, pour renouer le dialogue, force est de constater que la Russie n'a pas su saisir la main que nous lui avions tendue en 2019. L'intransigeance des autorités russes dans le cas d'Alexis Navalny illustre l'échec de ce dialogue. De même, nous ne pouvons que constater le raidissement de, des positions concernant des arrêts importants de la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Le refus d'appliquer certains arrêts ne se limite pas au seul gouvernement. En 2016, c'est la Cour constitutionnelle russe qui a refusé l'application d'un arrêt de la Cour, remettant ainsi en cause la hiérarchie des normes. À la suite de l'agression contre l'Ukraine, le maintien de la Russie au sein de notre organisation ne peut plus être toléré. Je le regrette, mais nous devons tirer toutes les conséquences de cette agression. Il en va de la crédibilité du Conseil de l'Europe, il en va de notre crédibilité. Pourquoi être parti à une convention si, dans les faits, on refuse de l'appliquer et si on conteste fondamentalement les valeurs Mes chers collègues, nous avons été dupes une première fois. Ne nous laissons pas de 
avoir une seconde fois. La Russie nous pose aujourd'hui un défi sans précédent depuis la fin de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Jamais les valeurs défendues par notre organisation n'avaient été attaquées de manière aussi frontale. Face à cela, nous devons certes garder notre sang-froid, car il ne s'agit pas de déclencher une troisième guerre mondiale. Mais il ne s'agit pas pour autant de laisser cette guerre se dérouler sans réagir et je suis persuadé que les sanctions internationales finiront par porter leurs fruits. En attendant, nous devons marquer notre solidarité avec le peuple ukrainien qui subit une attaque d'une violence que nous n'avions plus l'habitude de voir sur le sol européen. Plus de 2100 personnes seraient mortes à Mariupol, illustrant le retour de la barbarie en Europe. Le Conseil de l'Europe ne peut accepter cela de l'un de ses membres. La Russie de Poutine n'a plus sa place dans notre Assemblée. Merci, monsieur. La parole est maintenant à madame Gunaï de Turquie. Thank you, chair. Dear colleagues, we are all deeply shocked and saddened by the Russian military invasion of Ukraine and I condemn this invasion which is a grave violation of international law and the UN Charter. This armed attack is not just an attack on Ukraine. It is also an offense on every country's right to decide its own future. It poses a serious threat to international peace and security. We, member states, must take action to halt this war in order to save innocent people from suffering. Russia's war on Ukraine represents an immediate threat to Ukraine and its citizens. Hundreds of civilians have been killed and millions of Ukrainian people are forced to leave their homes and flee. This war also affects the Russian people as sanctions of international community lead to Russia's complete isolation. The war is the heart of Europe also threatens the foundation of international law and security. We must continue to support the sovereignty, political unity and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, including Crimea and Donbass. We must continue to provide for the basic needs of Ukrainian people until they can return to their normal lives. In conclusion, I would like to underline that a ceasefire is urgently needed to prevent further losses and destruction. We continue to be deeply concerned about the deteriorating security situation and the increasing humanitarian challenges in the region. Turkey has expressed its clear stance against any revision of Ukrainian territory, territorial integrity and independence. Once again, Turkey's political political stance and diplomatic efforts are always in the service of finding peace and stability in a region that suffers from wars and resulting humanitarian crisis. We would like to find a resolution as soon as possible to prevent further humanitarian suffering. I hope the negotiations between the two countries will pave the way for peace. In that respect, Turkey's non-stop diplomatic efforts and The war is in Ukraine are continuing. Thank you. Merci, madame. Je donne maintenant la parole à madame Mara de Suisse qui est en ligne. C'est à vous. Merci, madame la vice-présidente. Chacune et chacun de nous est sidéré par la décision qu'il a à prendre aujourd'hui. Tant d'années à négocier, batailler pour garder la Fédération de Russie dans notre institution parce que chacune et chacun d'entre nous croit au dialogue, à des valeurs cardinales qui font que la vie est supportable ici bas, que ce n'est pas la loi brutale du plus fort et des armes qui gèrent notre vie ensemble. Plusieurs membres éminents de notre Conseil et de mon pays, la Suisse particulièrement, ont œuvré cela à des dernières années avec la Fédération de Russie. Il a été essayé de sauver ce qui, à la fin, s'est révélé insauvable. Parce que les valeurs, elles s'incarnent. La cruauté et l'horreur aussi. Les crimes contre des civils en est le paroxysme. Les corps d'innocentes et innocents sortis des décombres ou des hôpitaux, des familles qui fuient en courant sous les tirs des snipers et tant d'autres choses encore. C'est d'abord le droit international qui a été bafoué par l'invasion d'un État souverain 
et par la suite même le droit de la guerre, pour ce qu'il a de terrible dans son énoncé, a été bafoué. Il est temps de prendre position sans équivoque sur la suspension et l'expulsion de la Fédération de Russie de notre institution. Nos pensées vont d'abord et surtout au peuple ukrainien, dont nous saluons la force et le courage. Le rapport qui nous est soumis contient plusieurs volets. J'aimerais m'arrêter sur deux d'entre eux en particulier. L'évacuation et la protection des civils dans les pays membres de notre Conseil de l'Europe par des couloirs humanitaires. Il faut cesser ces crimes contre les civils sur place ou qui essaient de fuir. Parmi les gens qui ont réussi à fuir, certains sont déjà accueillis dans les pays membres de notre Assemblée. La population de notre continent s'est manifestée dès les premiers instants. Et pour les Ukrainiennes et leurs familles arrivées dans nos pays, il faut veiller à une insertion qui ne les mette pas dans une posture de provisoire et d'incertitude. Nos pays membres doivent prévoir une stratégie du long terme. Mais comme toute crise, celle-ci met en lumière des points d'ombre. Ainsi, si cela ne semble pas avoir été systématique, il a été relevé parfois comme une sorte de tri entre les bons et mauvais réfugiés aux frontières. Pratique et rhétorique que nous connaissons dans nos différents pays, indépendamment de cette guerre. Il y a toujours des accords plus précaires dans la précarité. C'est aussi une tâche de notre institution de veiller à la dignité de chacune et chacun. Deuxièmement, chacune et chacun d'entre nous est conscient que des Russes en Russie risquent leur vie pour s'opposer à cette guerre. Ne les oublions pas, notre appel va à la Fédération de Russie pour cesser immédiatement la répression de la liberté d'expression de ses ressortissants. Il y a des mécanismes qui doivent être réinventés pour différencier les gouvernements et les populations victimes de ces derniers, par exemple. Ne nous les abonnerons pas non plus. Pour terminer, j'aimerais dire que nos institutions européennes sont bousculées par cette guerre. Elles nous font réfléchir à qui nous sommes, à notre identité. Cette Assemblée n'est pas épargnée par cette réflexion, d'autant plus que nous avons voulu être une force égale, voire un contrepoids au comité des ministres. Celui-ci nous demande notre avis, nous ne devons pas faillir. Conscients des efforts entrepris, de dialogue restés lettres mortes. Condamnant sans l'ombre d'un doute l'agression russe envers l'Ukraine, pays souverain, et horrifiés par les attaques subies par les civils, nous devrons soutenir ce rapport de manière convaincue et par le plus grand nombre. Merci, madame. Je donne maintenant la parole à monsieur Hispan d'Espagne. Merci, madame la présidente. Sont muchas las generaciones de europeos que hemos convivido con la guerra. Mi padre vivió la guerra civil española, su generación la guerra mundial. Todos nosotros hemos sido testigos de las guerras de los Balcanes y en el Cáucaso. Y aún así creíamos que negando la existencia del mal, este desaparecería. No, vivi no vivimos en un mundo basados en, basado en leyes y normas. El acta final de Helsinki, firmada por todos los países europeos en 1975, no ha acabado con la revisión de fronteras. La caída del muro de Berlín no ha puesto fin a la idea de la política de bloques y a la imposición de la voluntad de una nación sobre el libre derecho soberano de otras más débiles. Ucrania en 2022 repite lo que su sucedió en Hungría en 1956 y en la entonces Checoslovaquia en 1968. Putin ha roto el orden europeo basado en la cooperación, la diplomacia y la resolución pacífica de los conflictos. La democracia y los vínculos económicos, energéticos, financieros y comerciales no han sido suficientes para detener sus ansias expansionistas. Mirando para otro lado, como en Georgia en 2008 o tolerando de hecho lo sucedido con la ocupación de Crimea en 2014, es decir, apaciguando a Putin, no hemos tenido la paz y la agresión y la guerra es cada día más brutal. Integrando a Rusia en esta institución no se han garantizado los derechos humanos. A Ucrania se le ha fallado demasiadas veces. En 1994, Ucrania se desarmó de sus cabezas nucleares y, a cambio, Rusia y la comunidad internacional se comprometieron a garantizar sus fronteras. En 2014, Rusia ocupó Crimea y Donbass y esta institución fue incapaz de hacer nada. Esta institución es un referente moral y político. Nosotros somos representantes políticos. Es hora de pedir perdón a Ucrania, de decir a los ucranianos que el Consejo de Europa va a rectificar. Es hora de dejar de mirar hacia otro lado. Debemos decir a los ucranianos que tienen todo nuestro apoyo, sin límites, sin restricciones. Hoy esta institución está en un momento histórico. Nos sucede igual que ocurrió en los años 30 a la sociedad de naciones ante unos acontecimientos muy semejantes a los que nos enfrentamos hoy en día. Podemos atar nuestras manos y hacer que la ley sea una excusa para seguir sin, sin cumplir con nuestra responsabilidad. O podemos decir que nos levantamos, que tenemos el deber no solo de expulsar a Rusia, sino también de enviar un mensaje político de que Ucrania tiene el derecho sobre su cielo y que es justo que solicites nuestra protección. 
de que tienen todo nuestro apoyo en todo lo que necesiten. Yo tengo claro lo que esta Asamblea debe defender y a quién debe apoyar. ¡Viva Ucrania Libre! Muchas gracias. Merci, monsieur. Je donne la parole à monsieur Schaeffer de Allemagne. S'il est là, il n'est pas là. Dans ce cas, peut-être madame Martinez Ferro pour l'Espagne. Oui, c'est à vous. Ouais. El futuro de Europa y de los europeos, es decir, todo nuestro futuro, el de todos nosotros, se está librando hoy en los campos y en las ciudades de Ucrania. Su heroica resistencia es también en nuestro nombre, en el de nuestros valores, en nuestra libertad. Resisten hoy en nombre del respeto al Estado de Derecho, a la soberanía de las naciones, al cumplimiento de los tratados y al de las fronteras internacionalmente reconocidas. Así que desde aquí, mi homenaje y nuestro homenaje. Putin quiere hacer saltar el orden internacional de la posguerra y dar un golpe definitivo al proyecto de integración europeo también. Por eso hoy, más que nunca, esta casa, el Consejo de Europa, debe honrar los principios sobre los que se fundó al configurar un espacio político y jurídico común en el continente, sustentado sobre los valores de la democracia, los derechos humanos y el imperio de la ley. Todos estos principios están siendo hoy invadidos por Putin. Por eso debemos condenar de un modo firme, rotundo, radical y sin ambajes la invasión rusa, expulsarles, de formar parte de esta organización es un acto de justicia, porque hoy la terrible e injustificable invasión de la Federación Rusa representa un ataque absoluto a los más esenciales derechos humanos, que es la seña de esta organización. En esta casa no hay sitio para un agresor que invade, que mata y que viola. Y además, hoy debemos lanzar un mensaje claro de apoyo al pueblo ucraniano, y a sus autoridades que están demostrando un arrojo y una valentía, que son un ejemplo para todos. No podemos fallar a Ucrania, ni podemos actuar como si quedase tiempo, porque mientras discutimos aquí, hay bombas que siguen cayendo sobre hospitales, sobre guarderías o sobre viviendas de una sociedad civil que espera y clama por nuestra ayuda. La historia también nos ha enseñado que llegar tarde puede significar no llegar. Cuando la vida está en riesgo, los minutos cuestan vidas y la falta de coraje también. No tenemos derecho a temer consecuencias mientras condenamos a otros a sufrirlas. Es nuestro deber moral permitir y promover que Ucrania se defienda con todos los medios posibles, que defienda su tierra, que defienda su mar y que defienda su aire. Es nuestro deber moral apoyarles en su legítima defensa. Somos una organización política, una organización que representa a los ciudadanos, Así que atrevámonos a recomendar al Consejo de Ministros, al Comité de Ministros, lo mismo que pediríamos si fuesen nuestros ciudadanos, los que nos han votado, quienes estuviesen amenazados porque también lo están. Expulsando a la Federación Rusa ya estamos poniéndonos del lado correcto de la historia. Estemos a la altura del momento histórico. Honremos el coraje que los ucranianos están demostrándoles. Y de nuevo, dirigiéndome a las dos niñas que nos acompañaban hasta hace unos minutos, démosle el apoyo que nos piden para que no tengamos que avergonzarnos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, madame. Uh, J'essaie de redonner la parole a monsieur Schaeffer, que está en línea. Monsieur Schaeffer, uh, de Alemania, c'est a vous. Frau Präsidentin, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Bürgerinnen und Bürger in der Ukraine und Liebe Menschen in Donetsk, es ist furchtbar, wieder Krieg in Europa zu erleben. Deshalb ist es zwingend notwendig, heute Russland aus dem Europarat auszuschließen. Es ist aber zugleich hoffnungsvoll, dass eine so große Mehrheit demokratischer Politikerinnen und Politiker sich hier in der parlamentarischen Versammlung in dieser historischen Stunde sich einig sind, einig für den Frieden. Ich möchte etwas zu meiner Partnerstadt Donetsk sagen, mit der Bochum seit über 30 Jahren verbunden ist. Wir leisten in einem Projekt für Krankenhäuser medizinische Hilfe zugunsten leukämiekranker Kinder. Und wir haben gemeinsam erreicht, dass die Überlebenschancen der ganz Kleinen von früher 5 auf heute 80 Prozent gestiegen sind. Aber das ist jetzt nicht mehr möglich. Und genau das ist der Krieg. Er zerstört Chancen, er zerstört Hoffnungen, er zerstört Leben. Ich war 2004 in der Orangenen Revolution 
als einer von vielen tausend europäischen Wahlbeobachtern der OSZE in der Ukraine. Und ich weiß, mit wie viel demokratischen, solidarischen und freiheitlichen Willen die Menschen dort beseelt sind. Genau das habe ich auch gestern gespürt, als Abgeordneter aus Kiew in unserer sozialdemokratischen Fraktion persönlich über den Krieg berichteten. Und wir müssen gerade heute schmerzliche Wahrheiten aussprechen. Der Überfall Putins auf die Ukraine am 24. Februar 2002, für den gibt es in der jüngeren Geschichte nur einen Vergleich. Und das ist Hitlers Überfall auf Polen am 1. September 1939. Lasst uns deshalb jetzt alles tun, damit sich heute aus dem Krieg gegen die Ukraine kein Krieg entwickelt, der über die ganze Welt verteilt ist. Und wir als Deutsche müssen das tun, weil wir eigene Lehren aus dieser furchtbaren Geschichte, aus unserer eigenen Geschichte gezogen haben. Am Anfang unserer Verfassung des Grundgesetzes steht, wir wollen in einem vereinten Europa dem Frieden der Welt tun, dienen. Lasst uns das gemeinsam tun. Vielen Dank. Merci à vous. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Dundee du Royaume-Uni. Okay. Minuten, genau gepasst. Uh, Madam President, I will briefly connect three points. The convincing way in which our states have recently responded to nationalistic aggression, the transcendency of human rights over nationalistic concerns, and the prospect of greatly improved arrangements for welcoming and integrating refugees. Within our military response, certain wise aspects are, of course, during the Cold War already well practiced and uh, not in the least new, such as the avoidance of actions which would escalate fighting, in this case to prevent that between Russia and NATO states. Yet what is quite different is a muscular resolve to apply effective and hard-hitting sanctions, even if these may produce many economic disadvantages in our own countries. There's also now a much firmer and perhaps even unprecedented determination that the immature and adolescent agendas of disruptive nationalistic aggression will no longer prevail. That reflects the Council of Europe's belief that human rights must come before nationalistic concerns in the first place. Ironically so, that 1949 Council of Europe consensus might well have been established in Europe many centuries earlier on, between 1100 and 1492. This was through the enlightened and powerful Christian Norman rulers of Sicily, and who were nearly able to force the papacy to pursue ecumenical policies towards faith and religion, as it also was through the equally enlightened Arab and Muslim rulers of Spain, and who were entirely tolerant of those belonging to the Christian and Jewish faiths. Arguably, such a consensus by 1492 would have spared Europe not only its religious wars following the Reformation, but also the devastation of the 20th century arising from 19th century nationalism, including the Holocaust and ethnic cleansing, sparing us as well continuing atrocities in the name of wrong-headed nationalistic aims, even lingering into the 21st century and including those perpetrated by Russia and which we witness in Ukraine this month. Our shared views are that what matters most are not nation states, but people themselves and wherever they are. In recent days and weeks, by their unreserved Welcome to refugees fleeing war in Ukraine. That is exactly what our countries have confirmed. And along with its other elements already mentioned, it is this new collective determination and solidarity which will now ensure that Europe becomes a better place. Merci à vous. Je donne la maintenant la parole à Monsieur Gavin d'Irlande qui est en ligne. C'est à vous. Good afternoon, or oh, good morning, I should say. First and foremost, I stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, who facing the deadly reality of Russian aggression are fleeing their homes, seeking shelter and safety across Europe. Our assembly through this motion today will send a clear message to the Russian government that this behavior can never be acceptable. I welcome the fact that the Irish government, like many other European states, has lifted visa requirements for Ukrainian refugees. 
There should be zero restrictions on those refugees forced to leave Ukraine to come to any part of Europe. The positive response of so many countries to the Ukrainian refugee crisis shows what is possible when countries come together in true solidarity. But this should not only be the case when the majority of refugees are white Europeans and stands in stark contrast to the fortress Europe policy adopted by the European Union towards human beings from much of Africa and Asia. I also support the call for paragraph 14.5 of this opinion to be more explicit in condemning acts of racism against people from different ethnic backgrounds attempting to escape this war. We should also stand in solidarity today with the growing number of protesters in Russia who oppose Putin's war. Those who, despite the repressive reaction of the Russian state, have come onto the streets to demand an end to the death and destruction. Their courageous call for peace should be a beacon for progressive forces across Europe to come onto the streets and demand an end to this war. And whilst the eyes of the world are understandably fixed on the horrific scenes in Ukraine, let us also raise our voices for those who shelter from aerial bombardments in Yemen, in Syria, in Somalia, and in occupied Palestine. We are facing the greatest security crisis in Europe for decades. A failure to de-escalate this crisis will lead Europe once again to the brink of wholesale conflict and will undoubtedly deliver more death, more destruction and an even deeper humanitarian crisis. Every war must end at some point and diplomacy must, must restart. Rather than allow this war to continue to escalate and for positions to harden still further, it's vital that the guns fall silent and diplomacy and negotiations be given priority. What is needed is a comprehensive, sustainable and an immediate ceasefire, an end to the aerial bombardment, the withdrawal of Russian troops and a return to the negotiating table, to return to the Budapest and Minsk agreements which accepted the legitimacy of Ukraine's independence and created the basis for constructive dialogue. The thought of Europe sliding once again into the imperialist wars of the past is horrifying and must be actively opposed. The solution to the current escalation of military violence is not more violence. The solution is political, based on the principles of common collective security, which protects the well-being of all peoples and respect for human rights and international law. Thank you. Merci à vous. Je donne maintenant la parole à Monsieur Wells du Canada, qui est en ligne. Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. Since the start of the invasion, almost 3 million people have fled Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. Since the start of the invasion, almost 3 million people have fled Ukraine. Half of the refugees are children. There has not been a refugee crisis of this scale and speed since the Second World War. Vladimir Putin has repeatedly denied his forces are attacking civilians. However, journalists on the ground and civilian reports have captured how Russia's military has targeted hospitals, schools, and residential neighborhoods. Some see this as indiscriminate shelling, but colleagues remember that Russia has professional and well-trained armed forces and has had full access to Ukraine that has allowed them to deliberately target to these coordinates. They have trapped civilians and left tens of thousands without food, water, electricity, and medical services. And now we hear about kidnappings of local leaders. This is beyond reprehensible. Russia's invasion did not begin this past February. Colleagues, what we are seeing is only the continuation of Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 and shortly after the encroachment into Ukraine's eastern regions. Crimea was a test by Russia and the world's good nations failed that test. The mild response became a free pass. If the global response then was what it is today, then today may never have happened. And so we must continue to act decisively on all available fronts. To date, there has been a great collective resolve shown with respect to sanctions. We have begun and must continue other pressure levers. I speak specifically of oil and gas. The critical role of petroleum in the Russian economy is no secret. And so the sooner major importers reduce their dependence on Russian petroleum, the sooner we choke funding to its military. Canada has banned future Russian imports. As a Canadian from a petroleum producing region, it's disheartening to see some of our European allies so heavily reliant on Russian energy. Canada holds the third largest petroleum reserves in the world behind only Saudi Arabia and Russia. 
I acknowledge there are significant obstacles to Canada being part of the solution to Europe's dependence on Russian energy. One of these is the unjust reputation our oil and gas industry has developed over the years in Europe. Canada's petroleum industry is among the most responsibly produced in the world with regard to environmental standards, labor rights and safety. Higher than Saudi Arabia, higher than Venezuela, and yes, higher than Russia. Canada's energy industry should be helping Europe wean itself off Russian petroleum, not watching from the sidelines. As we, as we have observed from the events unfolding in Ukraine, many of us have felt powerless, but there is more that can and must be done to reduce the supply of international funds that fuel Russian aggression. Substituting Russian imports with a reliable ally supply is one logical step we can take together. Here, as an observer nation, Canada does not have a vote, but please know that you do have the full support of all Canadians. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole, toujours en ligne, à Monsieur Cotier de Suisse. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Mesdames et Messieurs, le 7 mai 1992 était un jour de lumière. La Russie déposait sa demande d'adhésion au Conseil de l'Europe. Quatre ans plus tard, notre Assemblée adoptait un avis dans lequel elle recommandait cette adhésion. Elle le faisait sur la base d'un rapport du conseiller national Ernst Mühlemann, représentant de la Suisse, qui rappelait les progrès faits et les engagements pris. L'avis précisait que la Russie, et je cite, « a l'intention de régler les différents internationaux et internes par des moyens pacifiques », entre parenthèses, « obligations qui incombent à tous les États membres du Conseil de l'Europe ». Fin de la parenthèse. En rejetant résolument toute menace d'employer la force contre ses voisins. Fin de citation. On ne saurait être plus clair. Trente ans après, notre Assemblée doit hélas constater, dans un nouvel avis, que ses promesses ont volé en, ont volé en éclats, littéralement. Le gouvernement russe a cessé de vouloir respecter les engagements pris. Il a cessé d'adhérer aux valeurs et aux principes qui fondent le Conseil de l'Europe et il ne peut donc plus en être membre. C'est un constat amer pour nous tous, notamment pour la délégation suisse qui s'était engagée pour réintégrer la délégation russe dans cette Assemblée ces dernières années sur la base d'engagements renouvelés. Nous vivons une heure dramatique pour l'Ukraine et sa population. Nous vivons une heure sombre pour l'Europe et pour la Russie. Alors oui, notre Assemblée doit appeler le gouvernement russe à cesser son agression et à se retirer d'Ukraine immédiatement et sans condition. Elle doit appeler à cesser les violations graves du droit international humanitaire qui constitue notamment les bombardements d'hôpitaux, de maternités, d'installations civiles ou le fait d'affamer ou d'assoiffer la population. Elle doit appeler le gouvernement russe à rétablir les libertés de ses propres citoyens qui sont gravement limitées par de nouvelles lois. Elle doit enfin manifester sa solidarité avec le peuple ukrainien. En repensant à 1992, j'ai l'espoir que nous réussissions néanmoins à nous projeter vers demain, quelle qu'en soit la difficulté, pour voir au-delà de cette désolation. Si la Russie quitte aujourd'hui le Conseil de l'Europe parce que son gouvernement l'en éloigne, soyons sûrs qu'elle y reviendra un jour parce que l'Europe est sa maison et son histoire. Comme le disait la rapporteure que je remercie, continuons de tendre la main au peuple russe. Madame la Présidente, Genève, ville berceau des conventions qui portent son nom à cette très belle devise « Post tenebras lux »« Après les ténèbres vient la lumière » puisse-t-elle revenir très vite sur l'ensemble de notre continent. Merci, monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à monsieur Ivanov de Bulgarie. Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, je pense que aujourd'hui, la décision que nous discutons, nous tous savons que c'est une décision définitive. Une décision qui va définir cette organisation, pas seulement parmi tous les autres organisations organizations, international organizations that exist, but unique community based on values. A decision that is going to define Europe, not as just a uh, geographical notion, 
but as a community that is based on the hope for just peace, based on human dignity, on, on freedom, and on rule of law. So today we're discussing to send a signal to the Council of Ministers, Committee of Ministers, uh, what to do next. And it is very important for us to be clear. I'm happy, not just in my personal capacity, but also as a leader of the Bulgarian delegation, to say that we are going to, and I'm going to vote for the proposed resolution to expel Russia for this, uh, from this organization um, as soon as possible, uh, based uh, on the fact that the Bulgarian parliament adopted a declaration which uh, condemns in the strongest possible terms the Russian aggression, criminal aggression, uh, against Ukraine. We owe this decision, first and foremost, to our fellow Europeans, the Ukrainian citizens, that are subjected to uh, horrific uh, crimes and uh, um, uh, 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 intolerable um, war against them. And we should understand that um, our best hope for peace is for Ukrainians and Ukraine to endure. If Ukraine is subdued by force, we will be living in a world in which we are going to ask ourselves who is next. And the list is obvious. And we need to understand and we need to send a very clear uh, signal, not just to the, to the ministers, but also to our governments and, and uh, national uh, parliaments, that supporting Ukraine is supporting our hopes for freedom and international uh, uh, model based on, on law and, and rules. This war is not simply a war against Ukraine, it's a war against our way, way of life, based on freedom, based on expectations of human dignity and guarantees thereof. And that's why we need to be united, we need to be very clear from now on. And this crime is not simply crime against Ukrainians or against the international community, it's also crimes against Russia. And we, expelling the Putin's regime, sending a clear message that we are going, not going to tolerate neo-Stalinist uh, despotism, and that uh, we are not going to tolerate lies and propaganda and, and brainwashing, we need to send also a message that uh, we are together with those Russians that are opposing what Putin is, that, uh, is doing. This is very important to, to be uh, uh, stressed. And this organization will need to develop new set of instruments to help those Russians and to be present uh, with them so that they are not alone. Thank you. Merci, monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à madame Hilliland de Norvège. Thank you, Chair and dear colleagues. And thank you uh, for this uh, extremely important text in front of us. Thanks to the rapporteur, Ms. Mrs. Gove, for her huge effort in making this to a historical moment for this assembly. It was not in horrifying circumstances like this I imagined my first speech to this assembly in circumstances when one member of our organization has invaded another. It is quite an unimaginable situation, and my heart goes to all the people of Ukraine who are victims of the ongoing aggressions, and to our Ukrainian colleagues. The images we receive from Ukraine are terrifying. The war resulting in thousands of civilian casualties, including hundreds of deaths. It has displaced millions of people inside and outside Ukraine. It has caused terrible devastation. This should end immediately. We should all support the decision requesting Russia to withdraw from Council of Europe. At the same time, we should bear in mind thousands of Russians that are protesting, uh, protesting against the war and have no access to free media, independent and objective information about what is going on. These individuals with their courage are also heroes in our time. Every day we hear about Russians risking their lives 
in their fight against propaganda and misinformation in their own country. And I know from my own experience, President, what it takes to stand up against manipulation by Russia. When I was uh, fighting for human rights in the biggest scandal in international sport and against the organized doping regime in Russia as the vice president of World Anti-Doping Agency, my family and I was threatened by Russia. We really need to support the courageous individuals that put their life in danger to tell the truth. They are our allies. The Council of Europe really need to support and find ways to reach out to these courageous members of the Russian people. These are extraordinary times for which we need to deliberate extraordinary measures. The Council of Europe does not have in its mandate to deal with this military issue, so I hope we say no to a no-fly zone. I sincerely hope this text can be supported by all 46 members. Merci, Madame. Est-ce que Monsieur Muresco est en ligne? Non. Dans ce cas-là, on va passer à la personne sur la liste. C'est Madame Turknarbor, Turknarbor, pardon, d'Allemagne. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, meine lieben Kolleginnen und Kollegen, während ich hier rede, während wir hier debattieren, rollen russische Panzer durch die Ukraine. Während ich hier rede, wird auf Zivilistinnen und Zivilisten geschossen. Während ich hier rede, verlieren Millionen Menschen ihr Zuhause, ihre Eltern, ihre Nachbarn, ihren Glauben an ein Leben in Freiheit. Während ich hier rede, verlieren Menschen ihr Leben. Die Menschen fliehen vor der Bombardierung und der Vernichtung durch den Aggressor Wladimir Putin, der die Ukraine mit seinem brutalen Angriffskrieg überzieht. Ein Mitgliedstaat dieser Organisation überfällt das andere. Was für eine dunkle Stunde für Europa, für unsere Werte, denen sich alle Mitgliedstaaten freiwillig verpflichtet haben, aber vor allem eine Katastrophe für die in der Ukraine lebenden Menschen. Mit dem Überfall auf die Ukraine zerstört Putin das friedliche Erbe der Revolution in Osteuropa, die nach dem Fall der Mauer und nach dem Ende des Kalten Krieges unseren Kontinent so ausgezeichnet hatten. Und ja, wir hätten gewarnt sein müssen durch die kriegerischen Handlungen Putins mit Tschetschenien, Georgien und in Syrien, mit dem aggressiven Überfall auf die Ukraine, mit den massenhaften Inhaftierungen von Oppositionellen in russischen Lagern, mit dem Verbot der Organisation Memorial und des Sacharow-Zentrums, mit dem harschen Vorgehen gegen die LGBTIQ-Community, mit der Unterdrückung einer freien Presse. In Moskau zeigt Putin nun unverhohlen sein wahres Gesicht. Wir werden jedoch nicht klein beigeben. Wir werden die putinsche Zersetzungspolitik, die darauf abzielt, die Staaten Europas gegeneinander auszuspielen, ins Leere laufen lassen. Diese zynische Strategie wird nicht funktionieren. Wir werden als solidarisches Europa zusammenstehen oder zusammen mit unseren Idealen untergehen. Wir stehen hier heute solidarisch mit den mutigen Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainern und mit unseren Kolleginnen und Kollegen aus der ukrainischen Delegation. Wir bewundern ihren Mut, ihre Kraft zum Widerstand und ihre Zuversicht. Es beschämt mich persönlich, dass wir ihre Warnung nicht vorher schon ernst genommen haben. Als Europarat sind wir jetzt alle aufgerufen, konsequent zu handeln. Wir sind die Organisation der Menschenrechte. Wir sind die Organisation für Freiheit und Demokratie. Wir sind die Organisation, die über Humanität wacht. Wenn über 44 Millionen Bürgerinnen und Bürger eines Mitgliedstaats mit Kriegsverbrechen konfrontiert werden, müssen wir so schnell wie möglich handeln. Auf die Suspendierung folgt der Ausschluss. Dieser Ausschluss soll aber nicht die demokratischen Kräfte in Russland treffen. Denen steht unsere Tür immer offen. Dieser Ausschluss ist heute unser Bekenntnis für unsere Geschlossenheit und Entschlossenheit bei der Stärkung der Demokratie und unserer Werte. Ich wünsche mir, dass wir dieses Bekenntnis heute in Geschlossenheit abgeben. Slava Ukraini. Danke. Merci, Madame. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Badiad Roumani. 
Grazie Presidente, signori colleghi, cari colleghi. Comincerò dicendovi un proverbio russo che noi in Romania lo conosciamo molto bene, che dice così, combatteremo per la pace finché non rimarrà pietra su pietra. E adesso potete capire molto bene perché ha detto il ministro Lavrov che non si tratta di un attacco all'Ucraina, ma si tratta di, eh, io lo so, di una cosa per poter ristabilire la libertà dei russi. Che vi posso dire? Praticamente la federazione russa tramite l'aggressione militare contro l'Ucraina ha rinunciato chiaramente agli obblighi e agli impegni assunti nel momento dell'adesione del Consiglio d'Europa. Praticamente è uscita da sola fuori. Stiamo parlando purtroppo di un paese per il quale il rispetto dei valori democratici, l'integrità territoriale statale e le relazioni di buona vicinanza rappresentano soltanto delle parole senza contenuto. Fatti dimostrati nel 2014 tramite l'aggressione e l'annessione illegale della Crimea e ulteriormente tramite la formazione delle cosiddette repubbliche di Donetsk e Lugansk e adesso, in questo momento, con la riconferma nei termini più pesanti tramite l'aggressione militare contro l'Ucraina. Cioè, non parliamo di un'operazione militare speciale. Così come non abbiamo parlato di un'operazione militare speciale quando i nazisti sono entrati nell'Unione Sovietica. Non è stata un'operazione militare speciale. I nazisti non sono entrati per debolscevizzazione dell'Unione Sovietica, ma per fare dei crimini. E così anche adesso. Non possiamo avere due misure in quello che, che diciamo. E noi tutti non siamo delle persone senza cervello. Capiamo esattamente quello che sta succedendo in quella parte. Un grande numero dei cittadini russi, così come la sapete anche voi, sono arrestati perché hanno voluto dirsi un'opinione, perché hanno voluto praticamente difendere la libertà dei loro fratelli ucraini, no? perché sono fratelli. D'altra parte, le immagini che vediamo ogni giorno in Ucraina sono terrificanti con un forte impatto emozionale, quadri di vita che hanno generato persino in Romania una mobilitazione esemplare da parte delle autorità e soprattutto della gente comune, che ha capito molto bene quanto sia importante essere solidari verso i tuoi simili che scappano dalla guerra. Abbiamo ancora bisogno della solidarietà per tutti, però che mai abbiamo bisogno di fermare questa guerra sanguinosa ed assurda che comunque non aumenterà l'influenza della federazione russa, così come spera il folle leader di Cremlino, ma anche, al contrario, lo spingerà all'isolamento più profondo a livello internazionale. Dobbiamo fare tutto e di più per riportare la pace in Ucraina e in Europa e nel mondo. Grazie. Merci, monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole a monsieur Kuhle, d'Allemagne, qui est en ligne. C'est à vous. Thank you, Madam President, dear colleagues. The attacks of the Russian Federation against Ukraine have been escalating since February 24th of this year, and this war of aggression has brutally shattered the European peace order. I would like to express my sympathy and solidarity with the Ukrainian people. I welcome the rapporteur's proposals, and I would like to emphasize that the European states launching a war of aggression against another European state cannot be a member of the Council of Europe. Many of my colleagues have already contributed important arguments to the debate, which is why I would therefore like to confine myself to some brief comments. Many of us today verbally condemn Russia's war of aggression. Many European governments have decided on sanctions against the Russian Federation and against Belarus. And many states are supplying equipment and weapons to Ukraine. And yet the courageous resistance of the Ukrainian people must fill us with shame. Because so many of us have not taken the warnings of our Ukrainian friends seriously enough for many years. Today, we should be clear. The security concerns and the goal of self-determination in states like Ukraine, but also in Estonia, in Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, and other European nations are no less important 
than the security concerns and the goal of self-determination in states like Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. We should take each other seriously when concerns and warnings are raised. Dear colleagues, the Russian war of aggression does not come out of nowhere. The aggression has been prepared for years, also through a massive campaign to influence liberal democracies in Europe. Cyber attacks, disinformation, state-controlled propaganda machines, and the covered financing of extremist parties. Russia has been using these and many other methods to undermine our open societies and liberal democracies for years. Anyone who wants to stop the Russian government's authoritarian aggression must also fight the hybrid warfare from the Kremlin. Dear colleagues, we do not know how long the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine will continue. Liberal democracies are now responsible for supporting Ukraine, especially when it comes to helping displaced people and refugees. But we also have a responsibility to strengthen and use multilateral forums such as the Council of Europe. We have to make sure that the crimes of the Russian war of aggression will be properly discussed in this hemicycle. That is the least we owe to the victims of the war. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole en ligne à Monsieur Brenner de Hongrie. Thank you, Frau Präsidentin. In dieser schweren Stunde möchte ich zuallererst uh, unsere uneingeschränkte Solidarität mit den Menschen in der Ukraine aussprechen. Diese Solidarität der ungarischen Bürgerinnen und Bürger kann man auch spüren tagtäglich. Auch dadurch bedingt, dass große Hilfeleistungen gesammelt werden und in die Ukraine weitergereicht werden, beziehungsweise werden auch die geflohenen Menschen aus der Ukraine mit allen Mitteln unterstützt. Und wie es von der Berichterstatterin auch erwähnt wurde, als Nachbarstadt der Ukraine ist mein Heimatland Ungarn wirklich sehr offen. Und hat schon mehr als 150.000 geflohene Menschen aus der Ukraine aufgenommen. Zweitens möchte ich betonen, dass natürlich gerade wegen dem Ungarn-Aufstand 1956 wir ganz genau wissen, wie das ist, gegen russische Panzer zu kämpfen. Noch dazu möchte ich betonen, dass ich auch persönlich erlebt habe, in der Zeit nach der politischen Wende 1989-90, wie das war an der Südgrenze von Ungarn, wo der Krieg von den Mitgliedstaaten des ehemaligen Jugoslawiens stattgefunden hat, genauso vor unseren Grenzen wie dieser Konflikt jetzt, wie dieser Aggressionskrieg von Jugoslawien. Des Weiteren möchte ich betonen, dass es wirklich schon seit vielen Jahren zu erahnen war, und selbstkritisch müssen wir hinzufügen, dass auch wir, die Mitglieder der Parlamentarischen Versammlung, nicht immer ganz stark zugehört haben, als Präsident Putin erzählt hat, dass der größte Fehler der Geschichte war, dass die ehemalige Sowjetunion zerfallen ist. Und mein Heimat von Ungarn wurde auch persönlich bedroht als Anfang Februar Viktor Orban, der ungarische Ministerpräsident in Moskau war leider, und Putin erzählt hat, die politischen Verhältnisse in Europa müssen aufgrund des Standes 1997 neu verhandelt werden. Das bedeutet, diese Aggression gegen die Ukraine ist wirklich eine Aggression gegen die bürgerlichen Demokratien, gegen die Ordnung, die wir 1989-90 in Europa äh, gemeinsam erkämpft haben. Deswegen unterstütze ich voll und ganz die gesetzliche Resolution. Herzlichen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Merci, Monsieur. La parole est maintenant à Madame Berlin Guerri pour l'Italie. Presidente, eh, colleghi, è un momento molto triste e difficile della nostra storia. È in discussione il modello di società che abbiamo sognato e costruito insieme. C'è da dimostrare con scelte e comportamenti da che parte stiamo. 
Siamo a fianco del popolo ucraino che è stato aggredito senza se e senza ma, impegnati perché si possa ristabilire la pace e nell'accogliere le persone in fuga dalla guerra. Non abbiamo dubbi, in questo momento non ci sono le condizioni minime perché la federazione russa continui a far parte del Consiglio d'Europa e ci sono questioni su cui dobbiamo riflettere per costruire e preservare il nostro futuro. Noi ci dobbiamo interrogare su come il Consiglio d'Europa può aiutare a difendere e a ristabilire la pace, a rispettare i diritti umani e lo Stato di diritto in una situazione come questa. Dobbiamo lavorare per fare in modo che vi siano politiche comuni tra gli Stati, per l'accoglienza di tutte le persone che fuggono dai paesi in guerra come l'Ucraina, verso un futuro senza certezze. E dobbiamo anche chiederci come potrà il Consiglio d'Europa aiutare i cittadini russi che si stanno coraggiosamente opponendo alla guerra e al regime autoritario di Putin. Noi non possiamo rinunciare all'idea che un giorno la Russia torni a far parte del Consiglio d'Europa e che lo possa fare perché pratica i valori alla base della nostra istituzione. Sappiamo che le difficoltà mettono in crisi i sogni e gli ideali di tutti e di ciascuno. Dobbiamo però sapere che solo se ci stringeremo attorno ai valori che ci tengono insieme qui oggi potremo superare le difficoltà che stiamo affrontando. Grazie. Merci, madame. Uh, je ne sais pas si monsieur Stroé de Roumanie est en ligne. Oui, c'est à vous, monsieur Stroé. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. We are meeting under extraordinary circumstances. A meeting uh, that I wish with all my heart would not be necessary. But unfortunately, the Russian Federation's horrifying, unacceptable actions leave us with no choice. We are appealed by this unprovoked war of aggression. And let us state things very clearly. We are witnessing a country murdering civilians of another member state, destroying its infrastructure, annexing parts of its territory. This is entirely against the principle that this organization holds close to its core, democracy, rule of law and human rights. And I would like to state my full support for this report and I urge you all to vote in favor of it as well as we all must show a united front and send a clear message to the Russian Federation. This, was, this will not be tolerated now in Europe. At the same time, I am exceptionally proud of the response of all European countries to this humanitarian crisis. We have all stepped up and we are continuing to handle this situation responsibly. And I will offer the example of my own country, Romania, that now welcomed over 500,000 refugees since the beginning of this war. And under the leadership of our president, Klaus Johannes, our response was swift and well coordinated. And I am proud of how my country stands together in helping the Ukrainian people, both the civil society and the government. And our efforts has, uh, have been recognized at the European level too as we are now hosting the EU hub for humanitarian assistance. Dear colleagues, in this terrible crisis, I encourage you to see a silver lining that is often overlooked. We have witnessed incredible acts of courage, compassion and empathy for the civil society all over Europe. And I believe we are now more united than ever in our common fight for peace democracy and human rights. Until a month ago, these values were almost a given. Now they are at the forefront of every European's attention and we are all determined to take every necessary action to protect them. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à Sir Chop du Royaume-Uni. Ma Madam President, expelling Russia is long overdue. The Committee of Ministers must put this right on Thursday, and I'm very grateful to them for giving us this opportunity to express our views. 
I first became a member of PACE in 2005 and ever since have witnessed the process of continuous appeasement towards Putin. I say mea culpa to our Ukrainian friends for not having been able to prevent this process. This is not just a war against Ukraine. Ukraine is the mere proxy. This is Putin's war against NATO, against the European Union, the Council of Europe, and indeed the whole civilized world. We in the Council of Europe have been traitors to our own principles. We have allowed a dictator's sham elections to be described as democracy. We have allowed defilers of liberty to describe themselves as defenders of human rights. And we have allowed a mass murderer to masquerade as a defender of the rule of law. It is therefore all the more inexcusable that we have not even been able to agree this morning at the Political Affairs Committee, Amendment 3, which calls on the Council of Europe member states to, and I quote, provide all possible assistance to the citizens of Ukraine in the defense of their country. Who could be against Amendment 3? It is a call for collective self-defense. In international law, an illegal act of aggression activates the right to collective self-defense, which means helping a country under attack, and that means helping Ukraine. Why are colleagues in denial about this, engaging instead in hand-wringing and words of condemnation as a weak substitute for the action called for in that amendment? So can I ask us to, this evening, vote for Amendment 3 and thereby show solidarity with our colleagues, our very brave colleagues from uh, Ukraine? And can I also urge colleagues not to allow themselves uh, to be blackmailed any longer uh, by Putin? Because Putin blackmailed us earlier on into not expelling Russia on the basis that if we expelled Russia, we'd be short of some cash in this building. Uh, how ridiculous was it to allow ourselves to be blackmailed then? Now we are being blackmailed into not supporting a no-fly zone, although we know that a no-fly zone is fundamental uh, to establishing liberty and freedom for our Ukrainian colleagues. And we mustn't allow ourselves finally, to be subject to nuclear blackmail. How can we possibly make that commensurate with freedom? Merci, Monsieur. Je donne la parole maintenant à Madame Kratschuk pour l'Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. You know, every Ukrainian remembers the first call he or she got on the morning of February 24th. Mine was from my mother. She called me and said, I heard planes over the house, and I think the war has started. And 10 minutes later, I looked at my window in Kyiv apartment, and I saw a bomb explosion. The Kyiv, capital of Ukraine, was bombed. It's been 20 days since then, 20 days of unprecedented courage of Ukrainian people fighting. 20 days of true political leadership of President Zelensky, government, parliamentarians, local councils. 20 days of unity in Europe and the whole civilized world, giving sanctions, putting sanctions to Russia, giving aid to Ukraine, both military and humanitarian. But do you think, is it enough to end this war? Well, when you be speaking here, I will be getting messages from my phone. Ukraine is on air alert again. What does it mean? It means that my eight years old daughter is in the basement right now. It means that my husband is fighting near Kyiv not to let Russians into the capital of Ukraine. Today in PACE, we need to send a very, very strong signal that Russian Federation cannot be 
part of this organization, Council of Europe, anymore, because it became country terrorist. Only terrorists are targeting civilians, bombing peaceful cities. 2,357. Do you know what is this number? It's the number of confirmed killed people in just one city of Mariupol. It's in Donetsk region. Mariupol hasn't had a proper green corridor yet. Even food and water is not allowed to be brought to the city. And we're speaking a lot about green corridors, but just think why we need these green corridors. Because bombs and missiles are flying from the skies to kill our people. That's why I'm addressing you not only as space members, but as members of national parliaments. Because you can influence your governments and to help us to defend our air, to put more uh, air defense uh, systems, to end this slaughter, because I don't have any other words for this. Every day on my phone, I receive the most horrible statistics ever. It's the number of killed children every day in Ukraine. I want to ask you, are these children, Ukrainian children, different than those who live in Berlin, in Paris, in Istanbul, in any other countries, in any other cities? No, I don't think so. But they are dying every day. Tomorrow you'll be traveling home with your planes, with your trains. Please think that the very same moment Ukrainians are fighting for European values. Ukrainians are staying in bomb shelters without electricity, without food, without water. So let's be strong, let's be united, and let's be brave to end this. And then you will definitely see us at April session. Slava Ukraini, Heroem Slava! Merci, Madame. Je donne maintenant la parole en ligne à Monsieur Gevorgian Garmini. Dear colleagues, following the debate these days, I cannot but ask myself, where has our organization been when a member state, Azerbaijan, unleashed a war against Artsakh Republic, Nagorno-Karabakh, and later occupied sovereign territories of another member state, Armenia? Let everyone be reminded that in September 2020, Azerbaijan started a war to deprive the Armenian people of their right to live on their own historical lands. Turkish combat drones were used to kill thousands of people, to destroy hospitals, schools, and residential housing. Just imagine the disappointment of, the, of those ordinary Europeans in Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia when they failed to see any sanctions imposed by the Council of Europe. Do my fellow colleagues in Council of Europe know about the humanitarian catastrophe in Nagorno-Karabakh unfolding these days? For more than a week, the population there has been deprived of natural gas supply and electricity. Residential areas are under constant shelling. Moreover, the Azerbaijani government has been using loudspeakers to demand native residents leave their homes or face real consequences. All these are evidences of ethnic cleansing and a deep violation of most basic norms of international law. But will our organization be able to prevent a new tragedy in Nagorno-Karabakh? These doubts arise from the fact that prior resolutions adopted in this chamber have de facto legitimized the results of the war unleashed by Azerbaijan by having artificially laid blame on both sides of the conflict. As a representative of Armenia, I understand perfectly clear the tragedy of any war. And I indeed am calling for peace in Ukraine as soon as possible. As much as it is painful for us Armenians to follow the continuing disaster in Ukraine, it is equally unacceptable for us to take note of the selective approaches on display by the international organizations. The importance of safeguarding peace and fundamental human rights cannot be any different for big and small states. There are no good or bad wars. I really hope that for us, the suffering of 
the Armenian, Ukraine, and other children in Europe does not have any geopolitical origin. We have to reflect why there are so often wars being unleashed in Europe. Therefore, not to lose our historical mission, we should reflect as to why, following the fall of the, fall of the Soviet Union, we have not been able to build a more conflict-free, united, and inclusive European family of nations. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à Madame Estrella du Portugal. Dear colleagues, on the 24th of February, the world changed. It became more dangerous and unpredictable. Whatever happens, even if there is a miracle, Russia's invasion of Ukraine will always be a painful milestone for democratic societies. Nothing will be like before. Today, my first thoughts went to Ukrainian women and children, refugees or not, who suffered the pain of many losses. I also thought of uh, Russian victims of Putin's atrocities. Russians are not Putin. I was born in a dictatorship. I know what the people governed by a dictator suffer. One can know how and when a war starts, but no one can predict when and how it will end. Remembering its history helps to understand how far we have come to get here. History does not repeat itself, but it has affinities. Anyone who revisits the 1930s will recognize in the present some signs that led to the tragedy of the past. Putin changed the laws that limited him in time and in the ambition of absolute power. It has already proved that democracy is not part of his vocabulary. That rule of law is just a concept for others to apply. That human rights are only those decreed by him. That Russia's borders will be wherever he wants. Putin's design is to restore the empire lost with the dismantling of the Soviet Union and interfere with the way of life of Western societies and, if possible, destroying democracy as he, he has tried through funding the far-right parties in Europe and interfering in the electoral processes in democratic countries. Putin has many means to achieve his hands, nuclear and cyber weapons. Ukraine is a member of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is the guardian of human rights. Human rights that Putin does not respect in Russia and with this war is brutally violating in Ukraine. This war is not just with Ukraine. This war is with Democrats and human rights defenders. This war is with us. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Je donne maintenant la parole à Monsieur Protasiewicz de Pologne. Il n'est pas là. Bon. Dans ce cas, Madame Castel pour l'Espagne, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Madame Chair. First of all, let me show my deeply solidarity with all Ukrainian people and especially with the Ukrainian delegation colleagues present here. There is no doubt that the invasion of Ukraine is clearly in breach of our statute, in breach of the Charter of the United Nations and in breach of the international law. It is a serious threat to peace uh, and security throughout Europe and with devastating effects on the civilian population provoking the worst humanitarian and refugee crisis in the 21st century. It is also a conflict between democracy and authoritarianism, a neo-imperialism attitude that denies Ukrainians right to exist 
as an independent state. We condemned the military invasion and express our support and solidarity with the Ukrainian people. But also, it's time to show our solidarity with those Russian citizens opposed to the war, exposing themselves to the repression of Putin's regime. We should express explicit commitment to the peaceful resolution of the conflict and call on the parties to establish an immediate, lasting and verifiable ceasefire which would allow diplomatic channels and agreements to be reached, leading to the withdrawal of the Russian troops and the opening of humanitarian corridors. We should call on the member states to comply international commitments to asylum and subsidiary protection. In that sense, we welcome the activation of the temporary protection directive in the European Union. But we also regret the double standards we have seen in Europe regarding the reception of refugees and the hypocrisy about how are treated the rest of the wars around the world. Finally, we reiterate our support for the democratic right to self-determination. State borders are modifiable, of course, but never, never through military aggression or coercion, but through democratic political process. A solution to the conflict and the restoration of Ukraine's borders will not be achieved only militarily, but through a withdrawal of Russian intervention troops and return to negotiation, tools and diplomacy. In conclusion, we demand international law, protection of Ukrainian people, immediate ceasefire, de-escalation, diplomatic solutions and may found the peace as ultimate objective in our decisions. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame. Est-ce que Madame Mercado du Mexique est en ligne? Non. Dans ce cas-là, on va passer à Madame Debourg pour les Pays-Bas. C'est à vous, Madame. Merci. Today, we have the longest list of speakers ever in this parliamentary assembly. It shows that we are united in condemning the aggression of Russia and want to express our solidarity with our colleagues from Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, whether they are still in the country or seeking refuge elsewhere. What should I add to all these voices? When I see the images from Ukraine of bombed apartment buildings and hospitals, of desperate people starving to death and looking for safety, I tend to fall silent. When I hear our Ukraine colleagues sharing their very own experiences and fears, I tend to fall silent. When I think of the enormous size of this war, its aggressive nature, the cruelty of the war crimes and the threat that it might get worse for Ukraine and for the world, I tend to fall silent. But we cannot stay silent. I admire those who, despite the war, can find the strength to make music in shelters where they have to hide from bombings, in half-destroyed apartments which they have to leave on the streets. As parliamentarians, we do not make music. We speak out, debate and adopt resolutions. We call on a Council of Ministers and on our own government to take action. I fully agree with the opinion we will vote on today. A country that aggressively invades another country bombs its cities, kills its citizens, and deliberately violates all that is at the very heart of the European Convention of Human Rights, simply cannot be a member of the Council of Europe. It's also clear that Putin and the others responsible for this war will have to be held accountable for the war crimes that are committed. As Parliamentary Assembly, we also have to call upon our member states to do everything we can to support the people in Ukraine and the people fleeing from Ukraine, and not only those with Ukrainian citizenships. We have to address the humanitarian consequence of the war, and we have to do so in line with the values of the Council of Europe. And although talking about sanctions is not part of our mandate, I want to stress that we should do all we can do to stop financing Putin's war. And this means, for example, that we should not compensate the rising cost of energy by subsidizing fossil fuel, as my country is about to do. 
Dear colleagues, we have to speak out, and we do, with more speakers as ever. But let speaking out not prevent us from falling silent when we see the images, hear the stories, and think of the unthinkable. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Uh, Monsieur Kin n'est pas en ligne pour l'instant, donc on va passer à Monsieur Zingeris pour la Lituanie. Uh, dear Madame Kravchuk, you will be with us together after a few months during the next session. And we will organize our civilization to fight the evil. We are trying to undermine the basic idea of freedom and of right to exist. I just try, I just try to say to you, few words from my mother. She is becoming on the 29th of March, 100 year old, and she spent four years in Nazi concentration camp, arrested by Gestapo. But she, she is a Jewish person. 18 year old, she brought to me two days ago her remembrance, how, how she was in camp, Stulov camp, the inmate 28,420. And she looked to the sky, every day expecting British and American planes to bomb this terrible concentration camp. And she told me today, she told me, not them let be alone like we were alone in the camps. Not let them alone waiting for, for the help. So from our side, I would like to stress like probably one of the few Holocaust survival family. Let's stop Mr. Putin to speak in the name of Holocaust survivals and, uh, and speak about the Nazification of uh, Ukraine. This is a crime undermining the Holocaust. Among soldiers uh, liberated the camp was Russian Ukrainians, huge number of Ukrainians, Georgian soldiers. You cannot monopolize the idea of the Second World War and winning the war while well, among was all nationalities who fought Nazi regime. And uh, Mr. Zelensky family was from Holocaust survival family. Let's support survival of the Holocaust, Mr. Zelensky, instead of uh, uh, looking to the claims by Mr. Putin of this false denazification. Let's start the decagibization of Russia. And from my point of view, I would like to say that uh, we was here three months ago voting for a uh, challenge of Russia Federation. We got 45 votes, 87 against, and now we have some few amendments. Amendments means, amendments means uh, mm, uh, support to uh, Ukraine. Support to Ukraine should be done in, in, uh, during our amendments, and we su should support uh, Ingert's uh, uh, report and we should vote everyone together, maximum supporting Ukrainians, maximum ensuring that Madame Kravchuk and Maria and Lisa will be together after two months. And uh, last point, Peter Tolstoy just uh, announced on his uh, Kremlin site, we will bring order now in every place where we want it. Mr. Tolstoy, you were with us playing a uh, Democrat. We will not let you bring the order in every place where you want. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Zelens Monsieur Zingeris. Uh, la parole est à Madame Louis de France. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Le ciel d'Europe s'est obscurci, nous rappelant avec effroi que nous ne sommes pas à l'abri du retour des tyrannies et des velléités de puissance qui ont si funestement marqué l'histoire de notre continent. L'agression du peuple ukrainien par la Russie de Vladimir Poutine est une ignominie, et cela a commencé en 2014 avec l'annexion de la Crimée. Nous avons suspendu puis réintégré la Russie, tout ça pour ça. Le 2 mars, les droits de représentation de la Fédération de Russie ont été à nouveau suspendus. En ces jours sombres, où des femmes, des hommes et des enfants n'ont d'autre choix cruel que de fuir ou de se battre pour vivre, quel rôle doit avoir notre institution 
lorsque l'un de ses membres viole les valeurs qui lient nos nations. Notre décision doit être claire. La Fédération de Russie doit être exclue du Conseil de l'Europe car elle s'est placée volontairement en contradiction avec les droits humains qui sont le socle de notre institution. Il en va de la crédibilité de notre organisation car si notre réponse n'est pas à la hauteur de la tragédie, alors quelle sera notre légitimité demain pour agir et qui s'opposera à ceux qui bafouent nos valeurs et sèment la terreur Évidemment, cette décision indispensable est un déchirement. Car la, car la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme représente pour le peuple russe et particulièrement pour ceux qui se battent pour la démocratie et la justice, un phare éclairé dans la nuit. Nous ne devons pas couper le lien avec la société civile russe, car c'est avec elle qu'il faudra construire l'avenir. Au-delà de la question de l'exclusion, il nous faut activer tous les leviers dont dispose notre institution et au besoin en créer de nouveaux pour tenter de ramener la paix et la justice, pour protéger les civils et les réfugiés, et lutter contre la désinformation, car la guerre se joue aussi sur ce plan. Plus que jamais, le Conseil de l'Europe doit agir stratégiquement pour assurer à tous, sur notre continent, la plus exhaustive protection de leurs droits. Il est en outre indispensable que les exactions et les crimes commis cessent, mais également qu'ils soient punis. C'est pourquoi la mise en œuvre d'une commission d'enquête et l'institution d'un tribunal spécial est indispensable. Il pourrait poursuivre les responsables de l'agression contre l'Ukraine et cela est indispensable. Aujourd'hui, fort heureusement, une union se dessine dans cette Assemblée et j'y vois là une note d'espoir pour le peuple ukrainien et européen. Mais la paix et la démocratie sont un engagement de chaque instant. Ne soyons pas non plus naïfs, car cet équilibre est très fragile. Je terminerai avec une citation. « Celui qui dit ou qui écrit que la fin justifie les moyens, et celui qui dit et qui écrit que la grandeur se juge à la force, celui-là est responsable absolument des hideux amoncellements de crimes qui défigurent l'Europe contemporaine. » Cette citation d'Albert Camus reprend une actualité cruelle aujourd'hui. « Face à cette tragédie, ne soyons pas ceux qui acceptent que force soit loi. » Je vous remercie. Merci, madame. La parole est maintenant en ligne à madame Yazar pour la Turquie. Bonjour, cher président, chers collègues. Je voudrais remercier le Conseil de l'Europe et cette Assemblée pour avoir tenu cette session extraordinaire et agi en temps en termes opportunes et rapidement contre l'opération militaire de la Fédération Russie contre l'Ukraine et Mme Ingrid Chou pour ce rapport complet. En tant que membre de la Commission des migrations des réfugiés et des personnes déplacées et rapporteur des enfants migrants et réfugiés disparus en Europe, je voudrais attirer votre attention sur les enfants touchés par ce conflit. Selon les derniers chiffres, plus de 2,5 millions de personnes, dont de nombreux enfants, ont quitté le pays en raison de l'offensive militaire russe. En outre, de nombreux enfants et bébés ont perdu leurs parents dans le conflit en Ukraine. Aujourd'hui, nous savons très bien que le sort des enfants migrants non accompagnés est l'un des problèmes les plus urgents de la crise des migrants. La situation des enfants est vraiment déplorable. Avec la résolution 2324, nous avons vu que des centaines de milliards d'enfants migrants sont portés disparus. Ce rapport a été approuvé la session plénière d'hiver 2020 avec le vote de chacun d'entre vous. Je ne souhaite pas, mais aujourd'hui, ce conflit peut causer beaucoup plus à disparaître. Ils ont besoin de nous pour vivre et pour se sauver entre les mains de gangs, de drogues, de trafiquants d'êtres humains. Nous devons leur donner la protection qu'ils méritent. C'est notre devoir et leur droit aussi. Je souhaite qu'un chapitre séparé soit ouvert 
sur cette question au sein de l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe et que attention particulière lui soit accordée. Merci beaucoup. Merci Madame. La parole est maintenant à Sir Lloyd pour le Royaume-Uni. Thank you, um, uh, President. Um, let, let me begin by thanking our rapporteur for what is both a, an excellent document, but, in, but one that's been improved during the course of its time through uh, our, our Assembly's deliberations. It's now a very powerful political statement that does two uh, uh, mutually reinforced things. It, it gives a very clear signal to the Council of Ministers that we expect the expulsion of Russia from the Council of Europe. It also says to our colleagues uh, um, the, in, on the Council of Ministers that they must do that quickly. There is no delay uh, needed in this. But importantly, it says to our Ukrainian friends and colleagues here in this hemicycle, but in Ukraine, that we stand with them. Now, words of solidarity aren't e enough, but that expulsion of Russia is a signal of our intent to commit ourselves to the basic human rights values that this Council of Europe uh, 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 operates on. I, I will say in my own country, not here, that I will also support the, um, because we admire so much the defence that the Ukrainians have put up against the Russian aggression, um, that, that, that their right of self-defence and that we, my country, should be one of those that supports military, that campaign of self-defence. But that's not for this hemicycle. What is for this hemicycle is to condemn Mr Putin uh, because this isn't a war of the Russian people. It's a war of the government of the Russian Federation. It's Mr. Putin and those immediately around him, those making war in Ukraine as well, those in command positions, who will, in the long run, have to face the, the potential for, um, for, for criminal action. Because, of course, these actions of aggression are criminal under... In, uh, under uh, conventional international law. That message has got to go out from us as well. Um, but I also just want to touch, uh, President of May, on this question of humanitarian corridors. It is honestly beyond belief that a Russia, which learnt its lessons in making war in Syria with the destruction of cities like Aleppo, should apply those same techniques to Mariupol, um, where we've seen the death of innocent people, men, women and children, uh, without pause or without uh, cause. Um, where, Mr Putin, are those humanitarian corridors that you've promised to negotiate? Um, why are we not seeing people able to move? Now, this issue unites us here in this chamber. Let us give one very strong and simple message to the world, that across Europe we stand in condemnation of Mr Putin and his war of aggression. We stand in absolute solidarity with our friends, uh, our comrades in the Ukraine. That message, if we can achieve unanimity uh, today in terms of the important part of the resolution, the message to the Council of Ministers will give a loud signal across Europe. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à Madame Andri Kiné de Lituanie. Elle n'est pas là ah, je suis comme later. OK. Euh, donc, M. Mullartzik de Pologne, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, dear president, at the beginning, I would like to inform you that the Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, Deputy Prime Minister Jarosław Kaczyński, Prime Minister Czech Peter Fiala and Prime Minister uh, Slovenia Janusz Jansa, today they are going to Kiev. And, and they will meet with uh, President Zelensky. So this is the strong message that our countries are together with Ukraine, together with uh, Ukrainian people. This is our support and our strong message to the world. Dear colleagues, uh, in, the, in the second words, I would like to remind you I would like to refer to the prophetic words spoken by the president of Poland, late Lech Kaczyński, in 2008, after the outbreak of the war in South Ossetia in Georgia. And these words sounded like this. 
Today, Georgia. Tomorrow, Ukraine. The day after tomorrow, the Baltic states. And then maybe it's time for my country, for Poland. Unfortunately, the President Lech Kaczynski was right. Putin had to take the next step after 2014 to make everyone here believe that the dictator Putin is now seeking to destroy Ukraine as a democratic state and to destroy the Ukrainian nation. It also strives to create a Russia, Russian Europe without the rule of law, without free and democratic elections, without civil uh, liberties. An unprecedented and unjustified act of Russia aggression against Ukraine has revaluated re once and for all the sense of international security. Everyone sitting here has found out that the language of diplomacy, concessions, letting go of Russia does not bring results. The Council of Europe has also found out about this. The Russian aggressive policy has been worrying us for many, many years, and the respect for human rights in Russia has raised, raised and raises serious doubts. Waiving the sanction imposed on Russia following violations of Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity and the consent to return Russia to the group of member states of the Council of Europe have revealed the weakness of our organization and undermined its credibility. Let us not allow such a mistake a second time. Russia, Russia has received a large credit of trust from the Council of Europe and has wasted it, which is why we must now set clear and, and firm boundaries. Without internal changes, without change in foreign policy, without abandonment of attempts to change the order in Europe by force without respect for human rights, there is no return to the democratic states of the Council of Europe. Today we should all together urge, we uh, stand with Ukraine. Thank you. Merci, monsieur. Est-ce que Monsieur Lord Griffiths du Royaume-Uni est parmi nous? Je vous en prie, c'est à vous. Uh, dear colleagues, it's uh, a pleasure, well, perhaps pleasure is the wrong word, but an honor to follow the speaker from Poland in order to be able to thank Poland for the generous and gracious way it has received so many those fleeing from Ukraine at this critical time. Dear colleagues, I am a writer. Words are my métier. But I find I have no vocabulary rich enough to describe my horror at the catastrophe happening right now in Ukraine, nor the feelings I have for the people of Ukraine, and perhaps especially for its representatives with us here today. Maria, Olena, Yulia, Larisa, Yevhenia have brought tears to my eyes with their words. And Larissa's children, Anna Maria and Lisa, by their presence with us today. Nor do my powers of description allow me adequately to deal with the plight of the Russian people, trapped in their ignorance or the barbaric, gruesome nature of their leaders, Dante's Inferno, although written so long ago, was written just for such a moment as this. This is not hand-wringing, it's heartbreaking. The facts of the case have been well rehearsed and I don't need to repeat them now, but I do need to affirm my solidarity with the Ukrainian delegation with us here today, who tomorrow will be in Ukraine heading back to their bunkers and their shadow lives and with the people of Ukraine in their hour of need. And I affirm that I, and I'm sure others from our delegation, are going to work hard to persuade our own government to continue to be generous in offering support to Ukrainians in their own country and to learn to be more generous in their treatment of Ukrainians seeking refuge in mine. 
God bless Ukraine. Merci, monsieur. Je donne la parole maintenant à monsieur Rousopoulos pour la Grèce. Dear colleagues, the last diplomat who remains in Mariupol is the Greek consulant George Andrulakis. He's trapped there. Mariupolis and the places around are places where Greeks are living for the last 3,000 years. At least 150,000 Greeks are living there. And the first 12 people who were killed in the place were Greeks. But it's not only about my compatriots. It is about fundamental freedoms. We're discussing the report of our colleague, colleague Ingrid Skau, whom I congratulate for her work. What does the report say? That the Russian Federation has lost the right to be a member of this Council, of the Council of Europe, since by invading Ukraine, she has violated all principles of the rule of law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. Dear colleagues, as a chairperson of the Migration Committee, I want to assure you that we will do what is needed for those people who have left Ukraine not willingly. On the other side, let me point out a point of hypocrisy. I will not name in this session the countries that did not vote for Russian suspension, but I will do it in the next session, because I accept from these countries to vote differently next week. Three countries didn't vote for the Russian suspension, suspension and one did not even enter in the room, just to have it in our minds, because it is totally different here to talk about human rights and then going in a room in the Committee of Ministers and voting differently. I will end my short speech by saying that revisions of the borders as the war in our days is not acceptable. Dear colleagues, the German philosopher Hegel said that history is not the soil of happiness. You cannot find happiness in this soil. But today, we are in the place to take a decision which will put us in the right side of history. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne maintenant la parole à Monsieur Boulay pour la Roumanie. Dear colleagues, dear friends from Ukraine, dear rapporteur, I think that the conclusions of the report are pretty obvious and straightforward. In the past 30 years, starting with the attack on Moldova and the occupation of Transnistria, the Russian Federation has several times broken each and every norm of international law. Almost 3 million Ukrainians have been forced, up to now, to leave their homes and flee abroad, while several other millions are internally displaced and hundreds of thousands are captive in destroyed cities without basic utilities under continued Russian attack. This is not only the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe this century, it is beginning to compete with one year of battles in World War II. Our countries should join hands in doing everything possible to host and support all Ukrainians now in refuge and then to help construct Ukraine so that in the end people are able to go back to their homes and rebuild their lives and country. We have the tools. We should also have the will to do it. The current situation should not be tolerated by the international community. No state should be allowed to wipe out another country nor to menace an entire continent with a second Hiroshima. If what is happening now in Ukraine doesn't constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity, I honestly don't know what would do. With all respect for the independence of justice, I find it undisputable that Vladimir Putin and his generals should be brought before the international crime court for these crimes, and Ukraine should be supported in its claims 
before the International Court of Justice. Dear colleagues, we are far past the moment of pleading with Russia to follow the rules of the international order. Under the current circumstances, Putin and Kremlin have no place in the Council of Europe. Russia should come back only after its leaders learn the basic norms of coexistence. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Merci. On termine la séance de ce matin avec Madame Dimitri Trucheva de Bulgarie. C'est à vous, Madame. Dear Madam President, dear colleagues, this is my first time participating in PACE in person, and I'm probably one of the youngest delegates today. For our generation, war in Europe used to be impossible to imagine three weeks ago. First and foremost, I would like to express my deep solidarity and respect to Ukraine, its government, its citizens, and all of the people suffering from the war, no matter their location. Slava Ukraine. What we have gathered to discuss today is not merely the consequences of the Russian aggression in Ukraine, but also the identity of the Council of Europe, its message and its heritage to the future generations. We regret that, as a result of the Russian withdrawal from the Council of Europe, millions of people on the Russian territory may no longer be able to seek protection of their rights under the ECHR. However, we observe a flagrant disregard of human rights by the government of the Russian Federation, one that has been indeed systematic. How much longer should the Council of Europe tolerate this? Isn't this tolerance a threat to our identity, especially since it brings about absolutely no progress towards human rights protection on this planet? Unfortunately, the gravity of the situation is asking for the measures proposed in the opinion. This is one of our last resorts for preserving the Council of Europe as an organization standing firmly for human rights protection, democracy and rule of law. One thing is sure, the best way forward is the path of unity, efficiency and action, fast. Therefore, I support the proposed draft opinion, including but not only in paragraph 16, namely that the Council of Europe will continue its support and engagement with human rights protection in Russia. Today, not tomorrow, is the right time for the Council of Europe to show its main mission and purpose, peace. There is nothing without peace, no economy, no culture, no tourism, no education, no healthcare, no future, just that. Let's fight for life. This is the main human rights and we are called to protect it today, not tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Madame. J'interromps maintenant la séance de ce matin. La prochaine séance aura lieu cet après-midi à partir de 15h. La séance est levée. Je souhaite un bel appétit à cet après-midi.